So let's imagine that we have two planes. Now, once if the waveform was moving along this plane, you would see it like that. Then, you see another one was moving on the horizontal one. This would be horizontal like this. And the other one, this would be what we call Now, many people uh, call this one, instead of saying horizontal or vertical, because actually uh, the wave could be turned, those two planes would be just turning like that, so you would have a rotation of the two planes themselves. So people call it, one would be called electrical and one magnetic. So you'll find in some books uh, speaking about scientific aspects of radiesthesia. They are usually very old French books that you won't find today, but if you stumble on one of these books or a translation, they are going to be called sometimes vertical horizontal, sometimes the vertical will be addressed as electrical and the horizontal as magnetic. And then we would say the electrical one is the harmful to our body and the magnetic one is the it is good for our body. So but here we mean electrical, we mean electric like quality, <coughs> magnetic like, not really electrical or magnetic. So whether you call it electric like, magnetic like, I mean it's the quality of electrical and magnetic. Which was electric and which was magnetic? The vertical. And the vertical is the, the harmful one is electric light or electric. I, I, I prefer, in the books they call them electric, but I would rather say electric light because we are using it be, at a quality beyond the range of electricity. We are always speaking about a repetitive quality. So we say electric light or a higher harmonic of the electric. Imagine the electric is in resonance with other harmonics of electrical, so they would be electric light. This would be magnetic light. <coughs> Taken and set in section, and that you would have the electrical moving like that, and the other one would be moving like that, cuts through in the other direction. And they could be turning or not, turning. sometimes they just turn like that. So when they turn, you get something that looks like this, you know, it goes out like this shape and then out again. So you, you get like a 3D, something like that, going in and out, in and out in a 3D dimension, it's rotating. Otherwise, it's like that. Now, you know, for example, from our antennas, from our reception, you have your antenna, and it depends on your emitter, on the station that's emitting. If it's emitting both levels, you have an antenna with all those cross bars on it in both directions. If it's emitting in one direction, you choose the same direction like your emitting station. If it's emitting horizontal, you would cap it much clearer with a horizontal bar than with a vertical one. If it's emitting vertical, then like that. So your antenna actually tells you, in a way, which is stronger in the emission. But usually in all those emissions you have both. One could be a bit stronger, but you have both. So this is the situation, the situation we're faced with. Now, we have two things to consider here. Size, that's from the quantitative point of view. If we have the wavelength, if it's very small, or the amplitude is very small here. That's when we think that quantitatively it's okay, because it's minute. But like we said, compared to our cell, it's huge. So even on the quantitative level, uh, there's a huge difference between this and what our body can take. 
But now that we enter into a physics of quality, it's a totally different thing. This is totally different than this, you see. We're speaking two completely different languages, irrelevant of magnitude, irrelevant, completely irrelevant. It is just a half of quality, whatever it is. So you see, so when we speak of, if you can go small or whatever you can go, there's no way you can take the harm out from the quality point of view. So you could get a very, very tiny wave, but still you could get a very big harmful uh, side effect in your body. So it's, and that's what concerns us now. We are concerned with the quality of things. Now, in let's say <coughs> one or two uh, differences here uh, between quality and quantity. First of all, we said quality is repetitive. So we have to be able to take it out of its range. You see, we have, for example, if we go here, let us. point that we have to take into consideration. L let's imagine all of these in nature like that, all frequencies like that. We might have here, let's say, uh, the visual range. We might have here the colors in this way. We might have the sounds somewhere here. Okay. Let's, if you look at it, we, we could have everything fits into a range. X-rays, microwaves, everything fits into the range. That's from the quantitative point of view. And if everyone fits into a range, that means they are not interacting. Each one is totally different. You can't say, for, for example, now that uh, the uh, phones, my cellular phone, is interacting with the, with the red color of war. See, it, it doesn't, but qualitatively, your cellular phone, the type of energy coming into it, qualitatively, since it is repetitive, it would find something similar in the color range, it would find something similar in the sound range, and they will start resonating together, you see. So in harmonics, there is unity between things. Everything will find something within any range in order to connect it, and that's the law of resonance. You cannot separate. So the, every note you, you hit, the whole universe will move. So equality, so if we are speaking, let's say, like the seven colors, or the seven musical notes, now every one of them would be, would have a quality that repeats itself, because qualities are repetitive. So the, let's say we have seven qualities that are repetitive, from one to seven, seven quarters, and they repeat themselves. So what we are concerned with is not the, the color red, it's which one of those seven qualities is associated with the color red. And if the same color is associated with the C or the Do in the music here, then this is equal to this, you see? So I have seven qualities that go on all the ranges of the universe. So since we cannot imagine them without associating them to any range, let's say we imagine them associating them to colors or to sounds, we tend to sort of stick the quality to the color or stick the quality to the sound. Now here, let's look at it that way. There is a quality within the color range. Every range has qualities within it and has beside the quality within the range has transcendental qualities that are there repeating themselves of, of all the ranges. Let's say you look at the red color. Then it can uh, have an effect, depends on your data bank. Your data bank can associate it to roses, but uh, if there's a surgeon among us here, it might be associated to blood, you might not feel very happy about it. 
somebody. So it's it's very this association is really something related to the individual data bank within the range itself. If you don't see the the moment you don't see the color, the association goes away. It's related to what this thing triggers in your subconscious. But when we speak about transcendental qualities, it is something that you cannot relate to in that color at all. It's in the background that you don't see, but it affects you in a certain way. Now, if we take the color off, we discover what this thing is. And it's there, whether it's in the color, whether it's in the sounds, it's the same. Now, this is what we call resonance, this repetitive call. So now, what did we do now that we didn't do yesterday? Yesterday we were speaking about resonance between octaves in the same range, in the sound range. But remember I said, you can extend and extend. Now I'm repeating the same thing this morning, but I'm drawing the diagram in an extended form. So when you extend it, it covers everything. There is a point that once said you cannot pick a flower without without disturbing a distant star. I think that C.H. or something who said that. So you see, because of this resonance, the action you do like that goes all over the, the universe. So here we must know that if these qualities are repetitive and they are repetitive not only in this dimension, because this is a physical dimension, you know, it goes from small <coughs> to eyes, frequency, colors, sounds, microwaves, and television waves, and so on. No, what, remember we said yesterday, it goes beyond time and space. So if you could imagine this axis like that, another axis, another dimension like that, another one like that, another one like that, in all dimensions, that would mean that resonance connects differently. It's a, a sort of a multi-dimensional or interdimensional communication in the lines. So you see, so when, up, let's say our world is living in a certain dimension of certain electromagnetic waves in a certain direction, but there are others, each one living in a direction. Now, everything that happens in one resonates with all, with all the others, so it's one unity. So whatever we do, we are in resonance with a hundred invisible dimensions. And when we speak here about qualitative, we are in resonance with, with all those dimensions. When we speak about qualitative, we're only speaking about a certain range within the physical dimension that's measured when you see is that limit. It's important in the beginning, before we enter into the season, that we understand the bit, some basics. They might be difficult to understand in the beginning. I'm simplifying them very much, as much as I can, trying not to lose, uh, the, the, let's say, the conventional scientific background behind it. But this will become easy, you see, when we start speaking about healing at a distance or something, or, or when you start speaking about things like that, all that will click into place because this is just a way you know science tells of things in, in a way like that in order to try, try to understand reality reality doesn't necessarily follow this exactly so we're trying to use uh, for qualitative physics to use things from the quantitative physics in order to have a basis for us <coughs> we can start using completely uh, absurd uh, the, the, the words and things that are totally unrelated uh, to any science, otherwise we can't compare. And we can't convert, because remember, we said qualitative is convertible to quantitative. So you must have a basis for conversion. So that's why I'll try you a bit with some things that might seem a bit heavy to some. But you must try to, to understand this. I have color. I have subjective quality of color. And I have a sort of a, an absolute quality behind that, or a transcendental quality behind that. And you should be able to separate between the subjective quality of color and the transcendental repetitive one. Now, what's the difference between 
equals two. One is objective. And that's a very important thing. The transcendental one is objective because you can't see it. You see? The moment you perceive the sound, the moment you, you perceive the color, you're into subjective because your data bank, you will react. But what you cannot see, you cannot bring in any form of suggestion, even on the unconscious level, to something that you, there's no way of uh, somehow detecting it through the senses. Can you say that again? <laughs> what you cannot detect with your senses, you cannot influence subjectively. You see? Now, the first level of effect behind the color, the quality, comes through your senses. Because that's what hits you most, that's what you see most. Now that one could be sort of uh, It could be used objectively. For example, in color healing, you, you use the visible colors in you, you use them in an objective way because you try uh, not to make them interact with the person's uh, vision or something like that if you're putting color on a function point or something like that. But if, let's say, you're using colors uh, right on him where he can see the colors, if the subjective might just kick in and you have differences between people. But what you cannot detect with your senses is objective because you can't influence. But the problem is, what you cannot detect with your senses is so far away from you that you can't even <coughs> it might exist. See? So we are speaking about a transcendental quality behind colors, behind sounds, that is repetitive in all ranges and that manifests itself physically on an instrument, very simply, but when you hit one, then the other comes into resonance. So you know there is something between happening between the strings. The sounds sound different, but there is communication between the strings. And we are looking for that thing. Now, that thing is the same if it's a repetitive quality. So the quality is the same, whether it's in the sound or whether it's in the touch. Now, this is very difficult for us in the beginning because we are used to uh, the quantitative. Let's say I have uh, some frequency sound or a beat, a beat like this. Now I have a slow beat. So you would think, okay, the slow beat will automatically, like any rhythm that we do, Will automatically slow down <coughs> my sort of the frequency of my mind. And many ways you can do this to lower the frequency into an alpha state, you know, by any slow beats like this, you can start lowering it. But some people will try slow beats and they get irritated. So you ask yourself, yes, but you keep telling me no, I mean wait a bit, this, this slow beat is going to relax you. And, and they just get edgy, I can't. Or try this few five feedback machine and try to get them down to alpha and then they get irritated. Because it doesn't have to do with slow and fast, you see. In a way, your mind will try to enter into resonance with the slow beat and get slower, okay? And if you really monitor the frequency, it will be getting slower. But why is the person getting agitated if it's getting slower? You see, there's something wrong here. Because it doesn't move with speed. If I do this, you think this will relax me. And then as I go faster, you think, okay, this is more activating. If I, if I go very, very fast like this, okay, now, now we're going to wake up. It doesn't work that way. You see, what really happens is exactly like in here. You start with something that has moved slowly, 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 and then faster, 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 something like this. And then what happens here? Qualities repeat themselves. Here, in the beginning, something, I have a sort of a calming effect. Let's call it calming effect. 
and then here I have sort of uh, any effect, exciting effect. And then as I go faster, it doesn't get more exciting. It gets exciting and then all of a sudden it starts carving again. And then it starts exciting again. And then it starts, it keeps repeating. So you can make them, you have your instrument very fast. And in the very, very fast speed here, you would have also the calming and the exciting. So I could actually choose one of the very slow ones here. Although quantitatively, your heartbeat and your brain wave will get slower, but I, I can achieve an excitement of your energy field through it. See, so the quantitative is not necessarily the way we think. So we have to separate quantity from quality. That we should always have. It's not like when I have one dollar in my pocket, it's one when I have tennis, I can buy more things. No, I mean, imagine that you have one, you can buy a lot of things, and then when you have five, all of a sudden you can buy nothing, and then when you have seven, you can start buying something, but at nine, you can buy nothing, and then it, it just doesn't fit. And we should understand that. So I could choose anywhere, I could find something here that excites you in a very slow rhythm, slow your heart, be slow your rhythm, and get you, still get your energy field excited, and find something here that really speeds you up completely, and find something here that really calms you. And that's the nice thing, you see. Because everything in the universe lives in a certain speed range. Now you'd expect any range not to have the full qualities like the other range. Why? I mean, every range, it's a balance of qualities. So in every range there are all the qualities. So this is the, the sort of shift that, that we should uh, make is not thinking quantitatively in things. So once we get this, this repetitive quality is like something, like we said, that's, uh, we call that cyclic. Remember when I said when the farmer, uh, that's the cyclic thing that we are dealing with qualities that are eternally there, they don't go away, they don't come. That's, that's the cyclic effect there. Now, let's see if this, uh, how we interact with, with all that. Now, let's say, when I say qualities, what, what do I mean by qualities? Qualities mean something that is unlike the quantitative. You see, in the quantitative physics, it's the physics of quantity that's out there. In the qualitative physics, it's the physics of the invisible thing between the objects, or between the me and the objects. So here I'm measuring a relationship. The other one, I'm measuring something out there. A relationship means me. So what would be my measuring instrument in this? In the, okay, in the quantitative, you know, I mean, you have for everything its own instrument to measure depending on the range. But for the qualitative, then the most sophisticated instrument is the human being. Now, in an, let's take a musical instrument. A musical instrument is formed like this. You have here, let's see, take the monochord first. And you have a string. You don't hear much of the string, you know. It's mainly a, a very shallow sound. But then you come and change the shape a bit of the background, of, of the box itself, of the musical instrument, and you start getting more and more qualities into it. Now, I want to find an instrument, you see, I start using, let's say, the mandolin as my main instrument. 
then I find that maybe the shape will not resonate very well with, let's say, emotional qualities or with mental qualities or with spiritual qualities. Because, like we said here, colors, sounds, and all that, there's, and this is very difficult to understand, there's an octave of shape. How can you have an octave of shape? How can you look at shapes as, an, as another, just another octave here, just another frequency here? Look at that. You have the light going through a prism, and then it changes angles here, and you get the different colors. Okay. That means in a prism, how do you see the colors? Because each one changes angle, because it refracts to a different angle. That means that on a prism, there is also the conversion of color to angle. And angles are the components of shapes. So you see, so you can convert sounds and colors to shapes here. Now, you have books here that speak that there's uh, a book from Hansiani here. It's uh, a science that he developed in, towards uh, 19 something, between 18 something and 19 something. It's a very old book, but it's reprinted uh, now, and they have it out there. It's called Cymatics. In German, it's called Gematic. And Gematic deals very simply with how uh, sounds create shapes. You can get a drum and put some sand on it, you know, and, and bring any speaker under it. And as you change sounds, you'll get different shapes. Shape has to do with sound quality. <coughs> That's, I mean, when we speak shape and sound, we're speaking only into the sound range. So we're speaking again in the senses, in the level of the senses. But we know that on that level, every shape puts certain qualities to the sound. So you have the, the basic sound of a string, plus all the other supporting, you, you see, harmonics, now, not only just the octave, but all other harmonic that change with uh, the type of instrument, and that gives you the different quality of sound. The same note played on a clarinet is different than played uh, on a flute, uh, and so on. So the shape plays a role here. But we are speaking about shape, again, within the sound range. But if we can imagine that shape is just angles, it's just another conversion of colors and sounds. So actually, every shape here will enter into resonance beyond the physical shape range, beyond the sound, beyond everything, with one of those qualities here, and then be repeatable all over. I mean, from just like the others. It will be transcendental, go all over the ranges. But then there is one thing. A shape can be, let's say, if it's a complex shape, it can be more in resonance with one plane than the other. A, a shape might be more in resonance with the physical plane, another one might be more in resonance with the mental plane, another one with the spiritual, and so on. So, the more sensitive my shape is with all the planes, the, the, the better uh, re resonance and effect I can have in sending, but also in receiving. So, okay, let's find uh, the best music box here. What would be the best shape for my music box that reflects all the ranges in the universe? Okay, let's try it. Come on. Come on. Now, how about this shape? Okay? And a good music box? Well, a human shape. We're going to do some studies on human shape, uh, but on the 
wooden statues and things like that to take out the psychological influence and all those effects to study the shape itself. Because, for example, you are all, uh, uh, in a way, doing some form of healing. And then when you speak about uh, the chakras, that's a very important energy communication method in the body. Uh, now, what are, where, what are the chakras? Where do they exist? And I'll show you on, on a statue in Bajramt, you can find that they are related to the shape of the human body because I can make, take a statue, a wooden statue, and make you find the chakras on it, and I can use it for healing at a distance and just leave it there. You know, I'm growing old, so I don't do healing myself anymore. I use my wooden statues. They can do it. You see? But wait, it's oh, not finished. Okay. You're lacking something. <laughs> What's she lacking? There's something missing. The string. I, I mean, how ca can I play <laughs> on the music box without the string? We, no, we, we still need the string. I mean, in order, you know, to make this music box resonate, I need to attach the string. This won't hurt. It's just one nail here, okay? Oh, okay. And one nail down there, and we attach a string, okay? <laughs> it's a very simple operation. <laughs> hmm? uh, okay? okay, no problem? No okay. problem. Okay. <laughs> no, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay, we, but we, there are different ways. Instead of attaching uh, here and there, we said, you know, we can make a pendulum and have a weight somewhere and then attach it to one place. So instead of two nails, we can have only one nail in your head and have half, half a string with the pendulum, okay? Oh, sure. One <laughs> nail is better than two, but I mean, okay. Oh, we want to play, to play music on the string, I mean. I want to have a musical instrument here. I mean, so, no, you see? Yeah, so now well, I'm going to take, this is a, a short chain like that, but let's imagine the string. And, okay, we don't want to mess the hairstyle, so we'll tell her, okay, <laughs> you hold it in your hand here, mm -hmm. and with the other hand, you hold here mm -hmm. and pull. Now I have the string, okay, and I have my instrument. I can find the seven lengths on the string and play. Or have other instruments, of course, if, if I get a fine musical string, n not a chain line. Now if I have an instrument playing, just one note, I can test the different lengths here if I have it calibrated. And one of them will enter into resonance, so I will know that note. But the problem is, it's very difficult to sense it when it resonates. But if she leaves this, this becomes half a string that is attached virtually somewhere there. And when you play a note and I change the lengths, one of them will start showing emotion. That means resonance is happening. But this motion is not completely separate from the quality of the whole body. This motion comes here, this is my music box, so the if energy effect comes here, it changes this energy field, and I detect the quality in one of the seven here. So now, what is my best instrument now? It is the human body plus the string, in order to, we want to play music. Huh? So we attach the string. Now, the human body will, how, l let's say, will it react? Some energy field comes into resonance with it. Now, the more levels this body has, the more thing it is in tune with, the, the easier it can enter into resonance with the similar levels. So it's, I don't want just to enter into physical resonance, like musical uh, instrument. I want to enter on, on all levels and measure on all levels. So the shape of this body is related to the levels of energy around it. We shouldn't just think that my energy field is just there and my shape is there, and there's no relationship between both, because we said here, shape is just another octave. 
So actually, the shape of your body is a manifestation in shape of all the energy concepts and all the energy laws in your energy field are reflected into this shape. You see, and we all have basically a similar shape because of the laws of the species. And then we interact. It's like the template of the lotus that I explained yesterday. Our template is the same, but then we interact. We're born through parents. We interact with an environment. We're born a certain time, and, and, that, and that does, let's say, the changes. But the changes are secondary to the basic laws of the body. So that's when people say our bodies are made, you see, in the image of God. Now, some people look at that and say, okay, uh, it's a way of personification. Because uh, the whole universe and the whole intelligence and the universe and all, and all this is what I call God, but it's something that there's no way to perceive and there's no way to think about and all that. And you cannot interact with something that you don't see and you don't perceive and you know that. So what happens is you have to personify, our brain has to personify the idea in order to understand it and express it. Otherwise, it will say that you, you'll never be able to, to express it. Now, when you personify it, you have to do that through your data bank and through your subconscious. So w we say this is, okay, so you, you interact with the divine in a personal God that you have personified. And this means you have given God a certain image that's very similar to your image. And so you're in the image of God. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But let's take it from our point of view, from the physics point of view. We could also say that if all different energy levels interact together and they form shape, like on the drum when you put the sand and the different energy levels interact, the shape that is formed represents is just the conversion of those energy levels into shape. So the human shape is the shape that represents the ultimate collection of laws here. And it's a conversion of all those laws in the universe into angles, proportions, and all that, and then results the human shape. So the human shape, when you say this is in the image of God, that means it physically is a manifestation, but not manifestation uh, the way we look at, no, no, a manifestation on the number of fingers, Y5. Uh, the number of joints, uh, the, the, every little detail, the polarities and all that, every law inside it is a representation of all, the, the whole universe is represented in a shape. And this shape is the human shape. So you see, so when I use now the human shape as my instrument, I am in total resonance with the whole universe. That means that with this instrument, I can do measurements and measurements in the qualitative is not measuring something is measuring by becoming so that means i can make my instrument become anything in the universe and then i have the total information which is already inside it but in a latent form and in resonance it becomes evident so i can uh, get out any information in the universe through by using the human body as my main and this and when i mean human body it's not just physical physical vitality emotional mental spiritual i mean the whole the whole thing so because the total human body would be if we uh, could see it in a different way she, she would be looking like a jellyfish like, like let's say she'd be in the middle like this Yes, and then a first layer of thick jelly here and finer jelly there and finer jelly and, and, and we would have a big bubble here like that and that's, th that's the instrument. That's the whole 
her, okay? So now I have a, a fantastic instrument now. So why use another instrument? So this is our instrument from now on. It's an instrument that can interact with the qualities we spoke before. That means it's an instrument that can enter into resonance with any level beyond time and space interdimensional with any dimension and what the instrument is doing also is not just becoming what it measures it becomes through unity that means when it becomes what it measures the thing being measured becomes her so this instrument can actually not only access information but every time it accesses information the instrument changes what is being accessed so you cannot measure something without changing it so you change what is being accessed okay do, do we get our instrument okay you change it any change on the energy level ultimately will have effects on the physical level you see it, it but the effect on the physical level let's say is a bit less apparent but you can tell I mean it won't you, you won't <coughs> enter into resonance and then I look at you here and I find a Chinese person all of a sudden in front of me I mean you can it will not be that drastic change but I could find that much change I could find all of a sudden the whole Chinese culture in your energy system if we leave that long enough there it might start manifesting on the physical in very subtle ways you might change your food preferences <laughs> you might change your habits all of a sudden or things like that but don't expect it uh, to be evident like that on the physical but the changes occur it occurs and I, I, I'll give you an example when l let's say a person has an animal a pet and they love that pet so much give them 20 years or 10 years and <laughs> you notice there is a resemblance but there is no really no resemblance look at it logically you look there is no resemblance because the, the species are so far apart the shape of the dog will not change the shape of the human being will not change but you look and you say they look exactly like each other how do you do that? because our instrument kept the the nine tenths the ninety percent that's invisible and all of a sudden if ten percent is not really the same it doesn't really matter you see but I have the ninety percent so this is what how we should enter we're entering slowly into the world of quality but you must know your instrument can access anything in the universe that means your instrument by using its awareness it is actually changing everything in the universe so what we have here is a completely a sort of a changing evolving energy systems we are an energy systems everything is an energy system and energy systems are constantly interacting together and change I'm changing the others changing by information exchange the whole universe is in evolution but the whole universe is evolution in what in in all what I have I have consciousness so the universe must have consciousness now let, let's before we go further let's see what are the properties of energy systems we spoke yesterday that about the big bang that it was not just one impulse but it was more than that that it was must have had a second impulse with it one was the first impulse of 
let's say power, we could call it power in, 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 a, uh, in a descriptive way. The first impulse, the, the bang, is a, is a manifestation of power that creates duality. Then the second impulse is the one that created the motion that balanced it. It's the second one that's very important because without the second one, you see, you have here power came, created, split into now we have plus and minus. So we have duality. But we have nothing. The Big Bang just created opposites. But if opposites don't interact, you have nothing. You don't even have time and space. You have nothing at all. Now, okay, if we put them together, they cancel each other. If we take them away, they don't interact at all. So we have here a lost situation in every possibility. There's no way to make something out of that. But then the second impulse comes and balances them so that they don't come too near and don't go too far. You see? Balances by a law of motion. One goes around the other. And that then is the ultimate balance. From the energy point of view, it applies to everything. You see, it even uh, applies to your partnerships. If you put space in your togetherness, you become happier, you see. If you get too near or too far, problems arise. And that's the nice thing. Opposites need a law of wisdom to interact together. Because they are, when they interact without the law of wisdom, there's a tendency either of total separation or a tendency to, to cancel the pro each other's properties. So unless wisdom kicks in, you can't form the new unity that is bigger than... Now, why did I say the word wisdom? We were speaking about motion. I mean, is it just the use of words to, to make it more interesting? Did I use the word wisdom when speak here? Or I should be using the word motion. But motion could be anything. This could go this way. It's also motion. You see? Duality creates motion anyhow. Because the fact that you separate something and there's sound out in space, they're moving anyhow. So this must be a different kind of motion. So it is what? A balancing motion. It balances between the two. It balances between the two in such a way it's an organizing, balancing thing in a shape in order to create a larger unity out of both. Now, l let's take the word balancing. First of all, when you have a motion that balances, that means that this motion must have some, uh, when I want to balance something, then it must have an idea behind it, a law or something. And here is the law, you mean in a circle, there's, there's a law governing that motion. You see, if you study geometry, there's a law governing the movement of a circle. But law means what here? Law means some mental activity. So here it's motion plus a law that means a motion that has a meaning. And the meaning means something mental. So this is not just movement. So this is balance. Of course movement first. Movement. Balance. Meaning. But what does a law have? A meaning without the power of implementing is not a law. So it has implementation power within it. See, power to implement. But if you want to implement something, you ask yourself, implement it on what? 
I mean, how can you implement a law on nothing? You must be aware of what you want to implement it on, okay? I mean, yeah, otherwise... Okay, this one's very light. Yes? In, in what? It means intent to implement, okay? Now you have the intent. You have all those things. Now, what shall I implement it on? If I have all the traffic laws, and what's the use if nobody's driving a car, if I don't have a car yet? I mean, any law must be implemented on something. To implement it onto something, you must be aware of the existence of that thing. I mean, why make a law on something that you're not even aware of? So there is here, in order to balance between two objects, in with motion, there must be an awareness of their existence. So in the big, there, up there, there was an awareness. Consciousness. Now, we can use two words, consciousness and, and awareness. We'll use them in two different ways. We will use consciousness as the ability to perceive the things, okay? And use the word awareness when I apply consciousness to something, okay? So from now on, we'll use the word consciousness as abstract thing, as in my ability, just me being conscious. Awareness is directing that consciousness towards in a certain range. So consciousness is just the ability, but consciousness needs a program a data bank to work through to create an awareness. So the same consciousness here Okay, what were uh, we were s <coughs> now when speaking about consciousness and awareness because you know, everybody uses th the words differently so we will just uh, decide on how to use it. Consciousness will be referring to the abstract thing from the beginning, just the ability to perceive. It's having the ability to perceive. Your conscious have the ability to perceive. Now, to exercise consciousness into awareness, awareness, I will use the word awareness meaning uh, exercising consciousness towards something. Now this happens is, let's say there is energy of consciousness here, like a fuel of consciousness that we're going to use. Now, when I look at something here, I am aware that the carpet is green, that uh, of the shapes, the chair of you people and all that, because this exists in my data bank, this level, this range of awareness, and so Consciousness exercises itself through my data bank and creates my level of awareness. Now, here at the same time, let's say there are cells that exist in my body. Let's say an immune cell. It's using the same consciousness in the room. But its data bank is different. In its data bank, it has viruses, it has things like that. So it becomes, it uses consciousness to be aware of viruses. Although I am not aware of them, you see. And then it cannot see you as you are like that. It's not aware of you, of the room and all that. You see, so it's the same consciousness. But we're going to say consciousness through every data bank creates a different range of awareness. So consciousness will use it as the whole thing. Awareness will be the specific thing to every species. 
now. But we want, you see, we're greedy. We want to, to sort of expand our awareness to cover everything in the universe. And we, we will do that. I mean, we have to do it. But let's go back to the diagram here. So here, there is a consciousness and an awareness. Because you cannot balance something if you're not aware of its existence. So when we speak about a big bang, it's definitely misleading. It's definitely just, it's, uh, there's no way could have been a big bang and all the rest just comes up like that. It had all that in it. Now, if I go back to qualitative thinking, if I open the door to the other room we spoke about yesterday there, all of a sudden we are speaking another language. Let's see the people who are telling this about what's happening in that room, how are they describing this? They say, for example, in the beginning was the word. Well, a word has a sort of meaning, because if it just sounds, has no meaning. But a word must have a meaning to be labeled word, you see. If I say, just ah, ah is not a word. So, to form a word, it's not just letters, there must be a meaning. And there must be a word is there is a tool of communication. So here we have balancing, a balancing act, a law that balances. So it's a communication between the law and between the parts. So it's communication. The word has power. We have power, you see. So meaning, power, balance here, this ultimate balance that creates something much larger than the sum of the parts and with so much more capabilities and attributes that exists in the basic particles. Because remember yesterday I said many of the attributes are given by the shape of the motion, by the pattern. So the pattern itself creates something much more than the parts. So it is something that is changing what's in front of it. So saying the universe started with a word, but a word means some, a consciousness, an awareness. But we have it, you see. We have the conscious, we have the awareness, we have everything. So we have the word. So now, scientifically, is the word more accurate or just the bang more accurate? The word is definitely more accurate. I mean, you could use word. Somebody said, I could, oh, I could use a, a thought, an imagination to start. Okay, a thought is still not implemented. But a word means a thought, an imagination, a visualization that is implemented in a word or in an act. You could call that, I'm going to say, it is an act. Okay, an act is also good. Because you act according to something. But this action, when something balances between two opposites. This is what I mean by wisdom. I put all those together because a word could be anything. You could say a, a, a word that means nothing. But if the world produces ultimate balance to create a whole universe, it's, it's balancing between things, then we call that we can use, instead of all these, we can use the word wisdom. Now, what's wisdom here? Wisdom is the ultimate balance of what's it being applied to. Now, 
Usually, remember yesterday I said the intellect works in duality. It can compare. It can either choose this or choose that. Because it's left brain. You see, it's focused. I focus like this, I can only see either this or move and see that because now there is the I and the we. I'm, we have been now, we are now expert uh, separationists. <laughs> we separate things. So you see, I cannot see now this whole thing. I see either this or this. So if I see this, so I stick to this. You see this, you stick to this. And then we start fighting. You see? Because we are not aware that we are both, that, un that these two are interacting to give this unity. So the intellect will always try to balance. The wisdom does it differently. You see? Let's take the intellect first. Let's say in the intellect you have a situation with different positives and negative action, reaction situation, and you want to balance it. First of all, I have to start analyzing it, okay? So I start looking at the situation. But I can only analyze what I'm aware of. What I'm not aware of cannot be analyzed. Okay, so I take what I'm aware of. But what I am aware of is only 5% of what exists because I'm limited by the senses. So. Basically, before I even start, can I balance a hundred percent? Can I balance a hundred objects if I only see five? So, basic mental capabilities here are very limited. And then, because I, <coughs> I am now a sort of analytical person, specialized person, that means I have to look at this, and then this, and then this, you see, I can't see them all at one time, so I need time. So by the time I balance a situation, by the time I analyze the whole situation, the situation itself is long gone, so I have to make a compromise, and then I only see five out of hundreds, and that's the second compromise, and that's why we are very good at creating the mess we always create. <laughs> yes, that's it. Yeah, I mean, we're unaware of that. Now, would nature let us create a mess in the universe? Because we are, remember, an evolving energy systems affecting other evolving energy system affecting the whole change in the universe. The whole universe is a conscious evolving energy system. Because if all these are present from the beginning, you see, I am not sort of producing consciousness. I am using consciousness. And that's a very big difference. There's a Sufi master once said, do I see or is it the light that sees? You see? Is it the, the light that sees? And I'm only bringing it through my data bank to make it see within a certain range. I'm doing this channeling into a certain range. But the essence of seeing is the universe that sees. You see? So the universe is the ultimate from the first moment, the universe had all the attributes of life. And that's what all religions call divine attributes. And, for example, when, when you look at the attributes, there are also uh, some numerical uh, qu qualities of numbers in them. You see? Sometimes, they are arranged in 72 attributes. Like in the Kabbalah and all that, 72. Sometimes they are arranged in some uh, churches in Jerusalem and Christianity and all that in 81. Sometimes they are arranged like in Islam in 99. But actually those attributes are innumerable. 
Remember like yesterday when I said I have the apples? Arranging them in 99 or arranging them in... Uh, it's always something strange here. It's always something that boils down to 9. Because the 9... The, but the 9 is the closest thing you can get back to the 0. The 0 gets the 1, 2, 3. The closest thing you can get back to it but not, you cannot get completely back to it because the zero is going back beyond time and space then. You see? So, what we have here in time and space, it is not really, you, you sh if we are speaking about energy, you shouldn't imagine that the universe within time and space this is really the ultimate divinity that we perceive or not perceive or interact with or, or personalize or that. It's not that. That is just its manifestation within time and space. You see? That is just one word of this ultimate being. That's an expression of, we said energy is the ability to produce an effect. Okay, if I say one word and produce an effect, does that mean that this effect is the total me? No way. So that if everything in the universe is just one word, what uttered that word can utter a thousand other words. So somewhere beyond this time and space, is this ability. Everything within time and space exists within this ability that's beyond time and space. But you cannot say beyond because once you go beyond time and space it is beyond and within and without and everything. There are no polarities. So it's this ability. And that's why we cannot really we can speak about the manifestations in time and space we cannot speak about what's beyond that beyond that if somebody says I'm a believer and so God exists and the other person says God does not exist both are half right and half wrong if you are speaking about the essence because there's no time and space there so there are no opposites so existence is equal to non-existence. It has both the ultimate existence and the ultimate inexistence in one. So the human mind cannot even speak about it. So we'd better not speak about it at all if we, <laughs> if we, we, are, we don't have the mechanism to speak about it. So all we're speaking about it is the manifestation itself within time and space. So some people w like to refer about the original essence before the six thoughts and say this is the ultimate void or ultimate non-existence. Another person say this is ultimate existence. Because existence and non-existence apply to the patterns that emerge from that primordial state. So, what we are speaking here is on the energy level and we are, what we are entering into resonance with and getting information with are just within one word and that's our universe. This is just one word. But the one who said it has millions of words. So, this is where we are now. Now, let's look at ourselves. How do we interact with this? Now, we are an energy system. In order to understand the energy system, I take one level that I know, and by that level that I know, if I know that there's a law of resonance, I could probably, with a lot of accuracy, somehow study the levels that I don't know. Like, remember when, when I, what I said yesterday about the key, if you don't, you, you don't find it under the light, I, in the dark you look at it under the light. So, now, I take what I know. When it comes to food, 
Am I an open energy system or a closed energy system? Do I create my own food? No, it exists out there. I take it, I use it, and then I discard it. So there's the state. Outside, comes inside, goes outside again. The state here is different than the state here, you see? And this is what I have three states. But the important thing in the three states that I'm an open energy system. See, it's something out there, comes in here, comes in there. So I'm just here, an open energy system receiving and emitting. Okay, when it comes to water, it's the same thing. When it comes to air, it's the same thing. I breathe the air. Before it goes in, it has a certain quality. This quality affects me, okay? It's affecting. Now, inside me, it is different than how it was outside. Inside me, I'm using it, but I'm changing its quality. Then, I'm sending it out again, and it has a different quality. So there are, I'm an open system, getting a quality, using it, giving it a quality, sending it outside. So I'm an open energy system. Okay, let's go now to what we don't know, our emotions. If we said emotions are energy, so our emotions must be part of the open energy system. I mean, if we are an open energy system, that means there's abstract emotional energy here that's been there from the beginning, you see? Because the law here, it's the law of balancing between two forces, you see? Attraction and repulsion, receiving and giving. So here are the seeds of emotion from the beginning there. So emotional energy exists out there. So there's emotional energy. I take it, I feel with it, and then give it out again. So I'm an open energy system here. Mental energy is in this room. I take it, I think with it, and bring it out. So the air you breathe, the air coming into you, has all those levels outside here. That's why in all ancient cultures you find them giving attributes and the personality to the air. They say, uh, like uh, they make prayers that the air brings us benevolent uh, things and uh, uh, it, it brings us luck and prosperity and all that. And, and uh, sometimes they say they give those attributes to directions. Let's say the north wind can, does that, the south wind does that, the east wind. So that means that the air carries on it when it moves. It is moving also all those energies with it. This is very important when we enter into further studies because you must understand now how can you separate me or deal with me as a person without dealing with the environment around me if I'm an open energy system. And that's what I said yesterday, what you do to this room will affect the others when you go out because the collective, this is what Jung called the collective unconscious level. Now, people were thinking, when he said about the collective, this was, he was speaking about something that is far away. W was it Akashic Records? Was it a certain thing? W what's he speaking about? Because he, w he was speaking about a lot of esoteric systems. Well, let's simplify all that. I I'm using very simple words. I don't want to go into anything. Let's simplify. Where is the collective everything? The collective, it's right here. You can, it's right here. <laughs> here not far away. <laughs> this is the collective. And if this collective, there is two ways it interacts with you. There is the motion, you take it in, use it and out, and then there is this sort of uh, the other aspect, the qualitative, that's the resonance aspect. Now, with the resonance aspect, the collective creates a collective in, the, in the, your depth. 
you see. So you're at the same time also in residence with the collect. <coughs> These are just uh, basic things that you're going through without spending too much time onto them because without really setting uh, the proper attributes of our instrument and how to use it, you wouldn't really be able to use your instrument properly and do that. But once you understand those things, not everybody is going to use it uh, in multi-dimensional things. Somebody might be just using it in, in just to arrange a chair, okay, but the other person might be using it in another dimension. We, our instrument can be used everywhere. Now, I think th there's a problem w w with this here. I have to move it a bit that way because uh, I tend to always get, stand sideways like that and you, you'll be seeing. <laughs> yeah. We'll turn it a bit like that so that as far as they can see so I can also face this all of you like this. Now, once we know all that, you're going to ask me, now, what is the importance of all that for us? Now, some of the instruments that we have are built to achieve resonance just with those things, are built to separate those levels, are built to do all that. So, unless we know we have the basics, unless we agree together on how we see things, we, we can't really go forward when we do advanced things. But once you look at this, it, if it's qualitative physics, the nice thing about it is it automatically goes, when you're aware of it, it translates yourself into your own system and then you feel, I, I already know everything. I mean, does any one of you think that he didn't know all that in one way or another? Maybe not in those words, maybe because I'm trying to use neutral words. I'm not trying to use scientific words or from any doctrine or something neutral words. But when you translate it, it sort of fits, even if it doesn't fit, it sounds okay. I mean, what's wrong with it? It sounds okay. Okay? We take now the break, huh? 15 minute break or 10? 15 minute break. Now, let us go further into examining our instrument because the better we examine it, the better we can use it. Now, I'm going to make like a scale here like this and imagine that this is the totality here. This is the totality of the energy in the universe. See, the totality of this one universe, because that's what we're speaking about. That means from the smallest frequency to the largest frequency. Now, in this universe, we could have 10 different dimensions, 100 different dimensions. Now, if I was standing here and I could hear all the hundred different dimensions. How would we be able to communicate? We wouldn't be able to, it to be mixing up. Besides that, if I could see hundred different dimensions, how could I move? I wouldn't know if you were solid or from the other dimension. I'd get mixed up. See, if I was doing something and something is passing here and here, here, you, you'd get mixed up with so much information. So, we have to be aware, we have to create an awareness. And the reason to create a, is an awareness is to be most effective in the propagation of life in our dimension. This effectivity. So, we should be aware take certain ranges here that really affect, are most effective for us 
and concentrate on those, concentrate our awareness on those. Like I said, consciousness can cover the whole, but this is on the subconscious level. But now on the conscious level, we want to limit our perception, limit our awareness to what really matters to make us most efficient in interaction in the physical world. So, I'm going to make a first level here and say this is a sense organ. You could have actually here uh, a different one, uh, uh, an eye, an ear, a touch. You could have different, we could draw it that way, you see. So you have sense organs here. Now every sense organ is designed in order to enter into resonance with one range and keep out all the rest. It's a physical design. So this is designed just for this range. This is designed, let's say, for another range here. This is designed for a small range here. This is a bigger range here and so on. And we keep out all the rest. And this creates now, this is where we want to create an awareness only for those, those things that matter. <coughs> but that means that our reality, the physical reality that we, we are dealing with, is only the sum of those and not the total you see so we call that perceived reality so our reality is actually is a perceived reality it's not a total reality because the total you have everything and this opposite everything that's opposite you have nothing at the end so this is our perceived reality now I'm interacting with the energies there. So, when I'm interacting with the energies here, I'm doing that through a sense organ. Now the sense organ interacts with the range and there is a nervous impulse here. <coughs> And it is either, you know, like a computer. You either excite it more or calm it more. You increase it or decrease it. So every one of those sense organs is using the same tree of nerves. Because it's one tree of nerves. You don't have a specific nerve for uh, your sight and another nerve for your hearing. You don't have the one for your hearing uh, where it can have sound flow through it and the other color. No, everything is being transformed into just <coughs> an effect on the nervous system. So, here we have the effect on the nervous system. In this tree, they are all the same. Now, we come here. So, here is the nervous effect or effect on the nervous system. Here, I have a scale to evaluate that effect. So the brain has its own scales of evaluation. Now nature works qualitatively, not quantitatively. <coughs> it sees the quantitative as the other side of the coin of the qualitative, it can see it, but it is mainly in, that's why we describe things. It's mainly, we work qualitative, and through the qualitative, let's say, this is exciting, this is calming. Okay, this is the main thing. But then it could be more exciting, very exciting, and all that. <coughs> okay, that's the quantitative part. So, but you always refer the quantitative part to the qualitative part, you see, in science is different. So, 
you need qualitative skills that have the quantitative thing. Now, what are the qualitative skills here? Now, you have the, l let's say, here, there are different <coughs> levels of interaction with the nerve. So, I want a skill to tell me about every one of those levels. So, I might, in the color scale, I might have here green. Then I have here yellow, orange, red, and then there are infrared things I don't see here. Here I have blue, indigo, violet, then I go into ultraviolet and so on. Now, <coughs> this is a scale. Colors are created by your brain. They are a scale. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, it, this, these are, I'm taking one by one the skills that already, before using a skill, why don't we take ones that already exist in your instrument? I mean, why should I use another one if I have one in my instrument? You see, for example, I could use, like we said yesterday, any scale, you could use dry and wet and, uh, and old scales. But I would like to see here scales that exist. So I, I'm taking them. The, I'll take each one of the dry and wet and hot and cold. This would be in the, well, it's also a scale. We'll use it. But it's, yeah, I'm going to take each one separately from your brain. But when we said hot and cold and all that, <coughs> that, would be in the, that would be in the touch area. That would be sort of in the uh, a scale related to the sense of touch. Then if I use the notes, that will be a scale related to the sense of sound and so on. So we're going to take every scale. But what are those scales? Now this is one scale. Here, if I go in this direction, and this nerve, when the nerve goes to my visual part of the brain, to the visual center, then the visual center uses this scale one, the color scale. The same type of nerve goes to the auditory center in the brain, and then I have here do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, let's say, or c, d, e, f, g. You see? So I have a sound scale. But then the same thing goes into, you can have a smell scale, but that's a bit more difficult. The smell scale, uh, <coughs> how, how would you characterize a smell scale? What would you say? Okay, pleasant and not pleasant, but, but this is, I want more, uh, a, a, a scale. You, you know, if it was a taste, I would say spicy and, and sweet, things like that. Uh, or uh, acidic and, and alkaline or there are so many th but on, uh, on a smell you could say sh uh, wh what do the people uh, who make perfumes how do the perfume people uh, speak what's their language what do they say <coughs> yeah but fr floral fruit and all that is, is very descriptive but inside it we could take something that's uh, mild or, or sharp or something we, we can find but it would be uh, this is more difficult for us to use the most obvious ones are color and sound but then we have touch you see these are scale one scale two scale touch is very easy you could have rough and smooth and can have hot and cold in touch so in touch actually touch is compared to the other senses it's a sense that uses so many scales touch is a huge is a huge sense because if you have a data bank what is data bank it's the information the total information that forms your personality so it's the your data bank would be the major part of what you would call your soul with everything in it this is the thing so from a child as you grow up which one of the senses play the most 
in putting data in there? First of all, because it's the widest spread. It's all over the body. You see, you can close your eyes, okay? You can close your ears, but touch is there. And then it's the most direct of the senses. I mean, look at all the pleasures in life when it comes to eating, when it comes to sex, when it comes to all that. Touch is the most, let's say, effective sense. I mean, what if, if you like somebody keep looking at it, you definitely will not get as much pleasure by looking at somebody like by touching. I mean, touch is, the, it's very direct and you can't close it. And the same thing, the opposite, not only with pleasures, but with pain. Touch is very direct, you see? So, and as it's found everywhere, that makes the skin a very, very important thing in our life. The skin, because it not only has the sensors of touch, but it also has the, I'll go that a bit later on, and what is the skin is. The skin is our information exchange layer. Whether I'm speaking about hot and cold, whether I'm speaking about acupuncture points, meridians, and all that, uh, whether I'm speaking about uh, vibrational protection, uh, the fat layers, and all that, the skin is a fantastic information layer. But I'll go in that a bit later. But all what we can say at the moment is that there are multiple scales in the skin, hot, cold, rough, smooth, all those scales. Now, there are instruments that use uh, those scales. So that's why I'm saying them, because some people uh, use them. Now, actually, what are all these scales doing? They're describing the same thing. They're just describing a, an energy quality. You see, because the nerve, the energy quality in the nerve is the same. Let's say, le let's make, uh, imagine we make a small experiment. Uh, you see, w what we tried before with the nail on her head, you know, now we'll make something nicer. We will take the nerve going from her ear, and instead of going to the auditory center in the brain, I'll detach it from there and bring it into and attach it to the visual center. And I'll take the nerve from her eye, going to the visual and attach it to the auditory now. Okay, it won't hurt, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, what happens when she looks at you like that Everyone will be a different song, a different tune. Because the, the scale is different. So everyone's transformed into a different tune. And she will only be able to see you actually when you speak. Yeah, because your ear is going to the visual, see? <laughs> so when they speak, you see them. If they don't, if they're silent, you hear them. It's because it's the same nerve tree. How, how would you like that operation? Yeah, interesting, <laughs> interesting <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay. Now, this means that all those are interchangeable, okay? They're saying the same thing. And also, remember from the prism, we can even have other things we can even put the perception of shape itself can come as a scale, remember, because the refraction of colors is converted into angles or angles into colors. So, because what happens is, how do I see a color? When the light ray takes this, goes through a prism, takes this angle, the effects of the angle on my energy system triggers this color the effect on the other so actually what you have out there is not colors it's just energy 
and it's the different refraction change of angle in that energy that produces the colors you see so colors are produced by your brains all those are skills produced by our, our brains what we have here is an the totality is an energy soup is it really produced by shape no this is it one of the translate all those things can be converted one to the other but one of the conversions is shape that we have that we have a, a sort of our system can because you see shapes so we have to put shape in relationship a shape scale in relationship to others now the shape scale here would be different let's say here it would be just different angles like that you see different angles like this and this would be the shape scale just different angles here so, so you would have a relationship between shapes sounds colors scents and and all those things here but if all those things are translatable from one to, if they are all saying the same thing that means they are translatable from one to the other okay is that is that clear if they all say the same, if I have a scale of inches and the scale of centimeters and I'm measuring things I, I can translate can't I convert this to that okay now why if all those things are convertible one to the other why are the laws governing each range different? We tend to take just the first level of laws, the local ones, and perceive them, but the transcendental ones, we forget about them. So let's look at it that way. In sound, because I have a, more than one octave, I can notice resonance but in color because I only have one octave I don't speak about resonance but if I had a second color octave I would notice let's say if I had a full color octave and my let's say my color perception would go beyond the ultraviolet and beyond the infrared and then start again another octave and we could perceive actually two octaves we would notice a relationship between them. So, the nice thing about what we're going to do now is say very simple. If all those scales apply to the same thing, then we are going to apply all the laws of all the scales to each other, to all of them. Now, this is a fantastic thing because it opens a completely new vision for us. Imagine you're going to apply the laws of resonance you're going to apply them to color to shape similar shapes can enter into resonance uh, with each other let's say uh, a healer now he has so many relationships but all of a sudden he might say similar shapes in the body through shape will communicate just by shape so it's because shape is translatable into sound and to color, so communicate s similar shapes as if they were producing the sound and speaking to each other, you see. So it, it opens new doors, this idea of resonance of shapes, resonance of colors. And, but resonance of shape I is, a, is a fantastic thing. If I make, if I stand and make a circular, turn my hand, keep turning it like this very soon I'll enter into a sort of a feeling of enchantment like a trance or something just by making a circular shape like that why because sooner or later I'll enter into resonance with the smallest atom with the earth with the with everything circular everything turning with the galaxies and and so and then I'll feel this enchantment just by making a circular shape like that you see so once you understand this it becomes a fantastic thing you see and then I'm entering into a resonance with every circular shape in the future and in the past. You know, just by doing that. So now, now we understand when, when you see in the Middle East the whirling dervishes, you know, when they keep turning and turning and turning. It's not just that they're getting into a trance because they're sort of 
losing consciousness uh, by turning. No, it's also because they enter into resonance with something bigger and bigger and bigger. So the resonance of sheep is very important for us. So now we can actually uh, use our body to form different shapes, can't we? So imagine this fantastic tool, using my body to form different shapes. I could stand like this and do uh, and achieve that effect or do this and achieve that effect or do that, achieve the effect or do this. You, you have a fantastic tool. Once you know the laws, uh, you, you can do whatever you want with them. So it's, it's very fascinating now if you start using all the laws from one to the other. And the thing you must understand is that all these are produced by your brain. They don't exist out there, they're produced by your brain. Now let's go on some, if you produce color by your brain, what is color? Color is, has a certain amount of luminosity in, in order to be able to have color. I mean, yellow is more luminous than red, is more luminous than blue. You understand this luminosity of color. That means, in another word, that color, you need light to have color. And it's, light is within color. Color has light within it. No, no, no. We're, I mean, they all, they're all one thing. I understand that, but I'm which comes from which is irrelevant. I mean, they're all one, one thing, you see. Now, if you produce, if your brain is producing colors, then your brain is producing light. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to produce colors. Isn't that evident? Now, is the light that you see in front of you produced by the sun or by you? I'm not getting answers. <laughs> what produces this? No, the sun is radiating energy. Yeah. Energy, your brain converts it into light. So you are producing the light. So if you want to see your inner light, it's in front of you. You see? It's right in front of you there. You are producing this perceived reality. It's produced in your brain. Is that also in the dark? I'll tell you something. When you close your eyes, and you dream, or when you visualize, does the picture you visualize, whether you're awake or does it have colors and, and light and everything? Does it? Okay. Okay, that means you produce your own light. A blind person makes its own light too. Yes. Because a blind person, it depends. If the blind person has a problem in the eye itself, in the organ, then he still produces his own light. But if the visual center of the brain, if you take that out, then he might not be able to produce light. But what will happen is the sound center of the brain will start transforming itself and produce the light for him. So, I mean, that's why blind people who are born blind can sometimes draw a tree, d d draw something. How can they draw something if they've never seen anything in their life? <coughs> it's, it's like uh, we stop and you want to change? Okay. So all the senses are created in the brain. Now, somebody might ask me, no, 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 some, the physicists, uh, I mean the, the regular conventional ones, are uh, here, have different opinions. There are two schools. One school says that it is produced in the brain. The other uh, school says it is reproduced in the brain. That means it exists out there, it is reproduced in the brain. Then one school says it doesn't exist out there, it is only produced in the brain. Now which is, which is right? Like I told you yesterday, no, if all the species saw the same reality, then the brain is reproducing something. But if everybody sees, uh, has a different reality, then each one is producing his own reality. So, 
because the moment you get somebody with diff the senses here attached to different ranges here, they form a different reality. So you are only taking 5% of the whole. So if you can only perceive 5% of the whole, how can you assume that you are translating the whole reality out there? No way. You're just, it's just your, that's why you call perceived reality. Are we ready? Okay. So perceived reality here is if I make my reality, I'm like a projector, you know. When you go to the movies, you, you watch the screen, and then in front of you there on the screen, you see the film, don't you? You have to see the film out there, and you think the film is out there. Is the film out there? No, where is the film? No, it's in the projector. I mean, where is the film that you see out there? It's a roll of film in the projector. But you think it's out in front of you there because it is projected there. What projects it? Light. Light. I'm taking another uh, example. I'm going a step further. Now we went to the step after you produced it in your brain. Now we're taking the next step, you see. The next step is after you produced it in your brain, you have to project it outside. See, otherwise, because this reality if it's not projected, the, it's not, you don't feel it as your environment. So the senses do not only capt information, it's not a one-way street. We spoke about resonance. No, all your senses work both ways. They are so active in reception and active in projection, in the projection of your reality outside, and then you think it's outside you but you are really projecting. It's like a projector. During the movie, you're leaving the film out there. But in reality, the film is in the projector. See? And the light is taking it out there. It's projected outside. So the projector is your brain, the film is in it, and you project it outside. Now, the act of projection and the act of producing light and all that, you, you see, takes energy. So a projector, if you keep it running for a long time, it will heat up. Same thing with you. I mean, seeing this reality, because it's a left brain operation, because the, your reality is uh, sort of made up through the use of the activation of the senses, what happens is it, it it's overheats if you use it too much. So you have to sleep. You can only use it for so long, and then you have to sleep a bit. You can't keep this reality out there for a long time because you need a certain amount of stress to have it. But there are easy ways. Whenever it gets too stressful, you daydream. So you activate the other part of the brain. And then it's, some daydreaming is relaxing. See, if a, pro a person has too many problems, he just daydreams. A bit, yeah, and then you feel... And it, with many people, it becomes automatic. You see, it becomes automatic. The more you stress them, the more they fly out. So, so it's... it's, it's right brain, or you want to hear some music, or you want to hear something, just to get out, because th this reality, and the more you concentrate, because reality, you know, the left brain, okay, I see reality, I go more into concentration, puts more stress. Now, if I am producing my reality, and I have a projector, I'm producing my reality. That means I can control it, I can put my hand in front of the projector, make some images, do things, so I can play with this reality if I'm producing it. But it doesn't work that way. Imagine that there are 100 projectors producing the film. I can't, wh whatever I do with one will not even be seen out there. Even if I close it off completely, I'm not, the film is still going on, you see. So it's like if I have one instrument with one string, and I hit the string, I can stop it and the sound goes away. But now if I have a, a musical instrument and I hit one string and that's my string and then stop it, the sound will not stop. Resonance. So the reality through resonance becomes solid. Resonance is a form of interference of reality and becomes solid through resonance. And then we can't 
we, we are part of forming it, but we are not the total formers of it. So at the end, it's, it becomes our reality. So this is our perceived reality. Now, what happens here? Here are the scales. But there must be something between measurement and projection. What is missing? <coughs> meaning, data bank. Because without meaning, I can't project even something. I mean, if I look at you like that and move my head a bit right or left like that. Okay, if it's just measurement, I can see with th three eyes, two mouths. Uh, I mean, why not? I mean, why not? But somehow there's a meaning level and there's a data bank that arranges everything. Like when you hold an orange and this orange looks orange. You go into so many li light conditions and you still know it's an orange. Your brain corrects, seems to correct. There's a data bank in there that has seen an orange and it corrects it. So there is, before you can project, now we have to have something, there's a meaning level before projection. Because if there's no meaning, I won't even under understand a reality. So the meaning level here is what? <coughs> the meaning level is my data bank. Because I can only understand through my data bank. You know, in, uh, uh, when the Spaniards came and during their conquest, they went to some remote islands in the Pacific and they would go. And when they, they went there, the natives had never seen those big galleons, those big ships. They'd never seen them, don't exist in their data bank. So the ships were coming in and these people were sitting playing on the shore. They didn't know they were invaded. And the ships were coming. All they could see maybe was a big cloud. Their data bank cannot form a ship if no ship exists in there. And till they came right up to the shore and they started seeing faces. All of a sudden this picture starts forming itself. And they knew now that these people were coming in, in, in ships. And because you get part, then you reconstruct the rest. But you, you keep waiting till you get something with which you can associate. And then you start making up the rest. By the time they did that, it was too late. The Spaniards were right on top of them. So, And uh, th this usually happens when people who have never seen an, an airplane and an airplane passes by, I mean, they, they see a bird or something like this. So you cannot see what is not in your data bank. And that's the whole idea about interpretation of dreams. Because something out there, a dream is not in our reality. You can only see it through your own data bank. So if an angel comes in this room, we don't know an angel is a law of nature. We don't know what an angel looks like. So every one of us is going to see the angel, to see an image in his mind that is different than the other according to what's in his data bank. If I've seen an angel like a person white with wings and, and all that, that's how I'm going to see it. I'll translate it by association to the nearest thing. If it's an angel that brings a lot of prosperity and a lot of nice things, this room and I have no idea of an angel I might see a vision of the nicest thing I've seen in my life it could be a lake a mountain could be things like that and that's how I would see it because this ultimate happiness that the angel is bringing will look inside my data bank to find what is ultimate happiness in my data bank and project that's why those things have to be uh, and uh, interpreted and that's where the awareness differs. Consciousness goes in there and creates a different awareness for every species. But everything is aware. If, remember we said the first motion, the first impulse had awareness in it. So the atom is aware of its parts. So if everything is aware, 
So you shouldn't think that we are the only people who say, the, this wood is aware, that's aware, everything is aware, the floor is aware, the glass is aware. But we should say everything is conscious, but the awareness takes it to its own uh, field of awareness depending on w what it is interacting with. Now, here, I make a line here. This is a very important line here. Between the scales and the data bank. The scales are subjective. I, I mean objective. Hey, I'm nobody even commented here, huh? Objective. And here is where subjectivity comes in. Here is where and this is objective. You should comment, shouldn't believe everything I say, huh? Okay. Why objective? Why is this objective? Because we are all made again in the same factory. We all work the same way. <coughs> Any change here is due, l l let's say, any differences could be only due to a malfunction here in the organ itself. You see? You could have a malfunction here by the time you get there and the skill will shift a bit. Let's say you can have a nervous disorder. So the information coming here will shift the scale a bit one way or the other. You could have a problem in the organ itself, whether your hearing is strong or not strong or, or a shift in it and the sound might be different. But in general, if you don't have uh, a mechanical problem, then the skills are, are objective. But when they come here in the subjective, they are reworked again. That's why you, you say things like, for example, uh, when, when you're in love, there's a shift towards the rosy colors, you know. <laughs> well, when you're sad or something, then there's gloomy, there's a shift towards the darker blacks and things like that. So actually, y y some people, you know, all the poets, the, the perception of the world can change a bit. And th that happens only here. Now, we are going to, there are two ways of using our body as an instrument. Here and here. <coughs> now, dowsing and the use of pendulums as you all know it. I'm sure you all have heard about dowsing one way or the other, people using pendulums, but more uh, as a psychic thing, that where you hold the pendulum or you hold a twig and ask a question. Yes, no. So the moment you, there's the word question, ask, you're here. So dowsing basically is a psychic activity. Now, psychic activity makes it subjective. Now, we want to have what we call radiesthesia. Radiesthesia means it's a word, it's a Latin word, radia, means radiation. Stesia is like sensitivity to radiation. Now, they have separated, it's a Latin word, they have separated this into mental radiesthesia when you work here according to dowsing methods. So dowsing is a part of mental radiesthesia. It's a very small part. Mental radiesthesia is much wider because mental radiesthesia we can use it uh, in esoteric fields like charting the inner levels and all that of our being. So you have a mental radiesthesia and uh, they have used for the use of strings uh, and resonance and all that here they use the word physical not in the sense of the physical level but in the sense of physics because the, it's the first uh, people who started developing a system in this range were 
French physicists in the 1930s, and they called it micro-vibrational physics. And then later on, since they were using pendler instruments and strings, they said, okay, how can we differentiate? Micro-vibrational physics is one thing, but it's, it looks to us like radiesthesia. You're still using pendulums and things. So they said physical radiesthesia and mental radiesthesia. Physical radiesthesia is using your instrument in this area without letting it go in there. The moment you go in there, you lose the objectivity. So this is one type, like musical harmonics and all that, is all here. But the moment you ask a question, this perception is here. We're going to study both, but we concentrate on this one, on the physical one. But we'll have to go into both. Because people who are interested in metaphysical studies, uh, trying to find out, are we made inside of one component, or are we more than one component? Where are those other components? Can I speak to them? Do they have a name? Do they have a number? Can I interact with them? Does one of them uh, live here? Does another one live on a multidimensional thing? Does Some people are interested in that. And so we will combine this physical radiesthesia with mental radiesthesia in order to chart the way into unconscious. So th these are very effective, but for now on, in biogeometry, we will concentrate on using physical radiesthesia because we are dealing with very dangerous things here. We are dealing with electromagnetic fields, okay, but we're dealing with earth radiation. So unless you use an objective method and you know exactly the difference between a vertical radiation and the horizontal one. You won't find a vortex and go in it and sit there and <coughs> think you're enjoying it uh, and think it's spiritual <coughs> while it is actually uh, a very harmful vortex. You know, like Sedona's full of vortexes. Now, there's a very uh, strange thing. When it comes to s such an interaction with this energy, you cannot depend on your feeling that I go in there and I feel relaxed. You cannot depend on that. Because a person who lives an in an environment with a lot of vertical radiation and his body is full of it, might tend to be attracted to an area that's full of that. Ultimately, at the end, it's very harmful for him. But he will be attracted to that area and then he will go and promote that area and say this area is fantastic, <coughs> it's a power spot, it's that and that and that. Somebody else will come in there and say, I I'm not feeling okay. Okay then, because you're not one of us, you know, you, you know but, but we feel it, we enjoy it. And ultimately they get sick at the end. So you cannot trust your feeling because, you know, even it happens to people, you hear stories about people when they buy houses. Some people have this thing about always choosing a problematic house. They can look for it among 100 houses. They ha have a house, let's say, with cracks. It's all cracking and all, it's always mold and all that. They leave it because of that, the problems. And they go and look, and they choose a house that might be renovated, doesn't seem that, but th they choose the house, and maybe this is the worst house in relation to mold and cracks and all that. Then they leave it, and they, they seem to be following them. Or somebody might have uh, something for haunted houses. He just go from one to the other. He has, it's like choosing them. Okay, these are not that bad, whether it's haunted, whether it's small. But it's bad when you have an affinity for vertical radiation and you choose houses that after some time you end up with cancer or end up with things like that. So it's no joke here. We have to be able to differentiate between power spots. And this is why the three days uh, of here. If I hadn't really developed physical radiesthesia uh, in the past 30 years uh, to a certain extent, I would have never even uh, discovered biogeometry. Because if you cannot differentiate, in all what we are saying, if we can't understand all this, then where are we? Asking questions, yes, no, again, and 
uh, or suggesting ourselves. Now, we, wh when you say the light is coming, when I say it's coming from inside, outside, and all that, people who are doing uh, metaphysical studies and all that can uh, understand a bit something about uh, th this is our head and somewhere in there you have the brain and then you have here the pituitary and somewhere here you have the pineal gland and then your eyes are here astonished or happy I don't know how okay and now they tell us that this pineal gland is formed like an eye like an atrophied eye that it was an eye sometime okay and they have found actually found some lizards where this area up there is nearly transparent but if it was really an atrophied eye then why hide it under the brain if it was supposed to see light but we know that as an eye it's very sensitive to light because when light hits it it can't hit it directly of course somehow it gets the information about light then it produces certain uh, things, uh, drugs, chemicals in your body. And when there is no light, it produces others. So the moment the light goes off, it starts producing things like, for example, melatonin. And it puts you to sleep. That's why if you feel in the evening, you feel, I'm not sleepy, okay, I'll sit on my emails. You sit on your emails and you don't sleep at all. Yes, because the light comes in, nothing there's no melatonin that's produced and melatonin as you know it's an antioxidant it's a healthy thing for the body and the reason is why sometimes we lack it in, in our body is because we have turned this artificial lighting everywhere everywhere so if you ever you, you find you can't sleep read the book you sleep but don't sit in front of a TV or, or a screen or something that puts light in there because you could actually sit on a computer and work till dawn and you won't feel sleepy. So, but if this was the main reason for this, then the logical place for it would be somewhere out there. If it's an organ that senses light, the logical place for it would be somewhere where it can get the light. Or why would we need it to begin with? Because the eyes can do it for us. I mean, the eyes can sense the light and send the information to the brain. Why have something that looks like an eye that gets information from outside, but at the same time is pointing downwards under the brain? Now, it must be when we speak of its relationship to light. Now we are speaking about light being created in our system. We create our light. So it is sensitive, it could be sensitive to something there, but it is also related to some inner light. You know this point in the ear, when you have your ear like that, in Chinese medicine, you imagine the ear like this to be like an inverted fetus with the eyes here the hands here you see and the legs here it's like like that and the points here in treatment they reflect every organ in your body so your whole body is present in your ear like that now in ancient times there is nothing called jewelry you wear jewelry here you wear jewelry there no at the time when the door was open you used things on your body for certain 
interactions with the forces of nature. So this point here in Chinese acupuncture is called the point of inner light. And if you put some crystals or diamonds here, that means you activate through resonance, you enter into resonance with your inner light. So your inner vision gets activated. And when they had uh, the, the priestesses, the young priestess in the temples, one of the way to activate their inner vision was to put uh, any type of crystal or diamond here, depending on what you want to, uh, to do, you see. Today, you find people <coughs> piercing everywhere. Now, that's very, very dangerous. You could completely disrupt the functioning of your physical organs by piercing at this point or at that point or this point. They don't know that every point in the body is related to a certain organ, and you don't know the point you are piercing with what is it related, what are you really uh, piercing, and what metal are you putting there, and what thing, uh, something might be good in one place and not in the other, and, and all that. So it's very, very dangerous to try to do something and say, oh, you know, we have seen, there is evidence that the ancient Egyptians <coughs> did some piercing and things, and the Sumerians did it, or we have evidence of tattoos in ancient times and all that but they chose the right symbol, the right shape, on the right spot, and all that. It wasn't just playing around. So, if this is inner vision, why here? Why looking here? It must have a link here, and something here. Your spine goes down here, but why here? Is it looking at something there. Why? Are we stopping for a couple of minutes? Or? Okay, then give me five minutes to finish this point first. We have five minutes there? This is America. <laughs> okay. What <coughs> the heart is the place where you have the most blood in your body. So it's the center of the fiery element. And fire produces light. So the mystical connection of light of the heart, perceived by the pineal gland, illumination, and then what's perceived out here with the visual center, so this light is in resonance with this center. So your inner light is here, and it is on a harmonic, a higher harmonic, to the actual light you perceive in colors. That's why in any mystical experience, the light effect, I mean, if you do some meditation or do some prayer or something, sometimes you can see that there's some slightly more light in your vision. Okay? Now that you've seen your inner light, it's time to feed it. <laughs> okay, this, uh, we were speaking about the fire here from the heart and there's a little drawing here that some of you asked me about. J just while you were leaving, I was explaining that uh, when a wave hits a surface and gets reflected and comes back to us, uh, we said it carries information. So when it carries information, there are slight changes in the shape of the wave that you can actually uh, see. So information, when we say carrier wave, it's not carried, it's not like we're carrying something on the shoulder, it's like carrying it inside it. It's like it carrying through change in shape. So ultimately it goes back to a change in shape. Now here, when, when we were discussing this, th now this explains some things. The people who had the door open to the other room spoke about the illumination 
always of the heart. They never spoke enlightenment of the heart. It's, it's some, it always referred to the heart, you see. So this, there's this connection related to the fiery center here, the pineal gland. So there's a link between the centers here, pituitary, pineal, heart, and the brain then. Now, before we go any further, we go back here. And say now, qualitative, this qualitative physics is very interesting for us because we want to take it beyond, I mean, we want to go into all those invisible dimensions, into the totality. Now we want to go into totality here. So when you use, for example, any form of uh, color therapy or whatever, all, all what we use in alternative medicine, in any type of thing, is always limited to the ranges that are within our perceived reality. We don't go to find what happens beyond this invisible environment or what's extra dimensional. We don't go there. But so first you ask me, well, why in first place are we interested now about the transcendentality, the transcendentality of the qualitative why? Now look at it that way. In order that you perceive your, your reality, <coughs> you must have working senses. Okay? Okay, that means your body must function before you can perceive a reality. So what runs your body? Is it within your perceived reality? Or from outside? What do you think? <coughs> what? How come? You need your body to function first to create your perceived reality. <laughs> so, see? So, I mean, your heartbeat, your lung, all the rhythms of your body, the laws that govern life, the laws that govern life, are not coming from your perceived reality. They're coming from the total reality. The whole universe is working through you in there, and then you become alive, and then you make a, your perceived reality. But what really work, all those rhythms, are methods of communication. Remember we said method, rhythm are communication. So you're communicating with the whole universe. Your life is through the life of the universe. This is the, the life. So you perceive reality can affect the total reality? No, how your body works. Of course, but to a limit. I mean, to a limit. Yeah, right. you, you, can, you, you can use your perceived reality to affect your, to raise your heartbeat or lower it, but right. very couple of heartbeats up or down, something <coughs> like that. But what is making your heartbeat in first place? What are the laws that make you breathe, think, or what are, where do those laws come from? Those archetypal laws, laws. The archetypal laws must be beyond the perceived reality because they must be there first for us to see perceived reality. Okay, now, if I really want to balance things, balance my environment, I can't look at myself as a being within the 5%. The mental aspect of the 5%, you see, like I told you, uh, uh, mentally, by the time I analyze what's happening, uh, it's long gone, the situation is long gone. So always a mental way of balancing things will always be a compromise. I only see 5%, I don't have time to analyze everything, and I, cannot, I can only balance what I'm aware of. And that's very inadequate if I'm only aware of 5%, you see. So now, we want to find a better way of balancing things here. There's, there are some 
better ways that already exist with us, and we'll take that as, a, as an example. What better ways can I see uh, in us? Whenever, l let's say, nature wants to perform something with a lot of efficiency, the, the natural laws, it will not leave it to your mental ability. It must override it. You see, w whatever uh, is so important that w we cannot be left to mess up, must be done by somebody else. Let's take an example. When prolongation of life, a child is born, and remember the first day we sp spoke about the forming process? The forming process is not something that can be left to the mental ability. Something more should, should be part of this forming process because you're forming visible and invisible. Now, what happens is we must have one of the two, I'll call them two species, man and woman, they're really two different things. I must have at least one of them that is in, uh, l l let's say, in the grasp of those divine laws, of those laws out, out there, so that it can form those sacred activities, those divine things, bring in divine wisdom. So one of the two should be linked that whenever we want the remote control click and its, its personality stops and the divine personality steps in, nature's laws come in. Now, women are like that. The divinity still has a remote control over their minds. See? When we men think, when I speak, if you could see the light in my brain, you're going to see always just a left side flashing. And the right side will not flash, just the left side. That's why they say we are more intellectual. But this could be less, less adequate because one side is dim, is not working. So the other side can work a lot, but still it's an imbalance. Okay, this is very good for, so that we are phys in the physical world, we can analyze, we can do that. But then, let's take the example, a baby is born, and I'm there with the left side really working perfectly. I've developed it perfectly. Now the baby moves. I, it has to move enough so that I hear, so that to wake me up. When it moves enough, I wake up, I look. Now I have to analyze. So I, I go and look at the face while it's moving. Then I try to discern from the face, is it something wrong or not wrong? See? And then it starts crying. By the time I sort of analyze the situation and come to a conclusion and decide what I should do, the lady could, <laughs> I mean, the baby could choke and be long gone. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Now, if the mother is there, what happens is, she opens her eyes, sometimes before the, the baby even, see? So now where's the cause and where's the effect? Before the problem is, she opens her eyes, and then the thing, and then she knows exactly if he's just moving, or is this happening, she knows all that. She, do, she doesn't have to go and look at his face, at his eyes and something, and see, is he that, is he, she doesn't have to do all that, she just knows it. And all that is so instantaneous that it seems to be quicker, the answer seems to be there before the question even arises. Now, this cannot be a mental activity. Now, this is something. It's, it has to go beyond the mental. It's a, 
a right brain function that does not analyze, that does not do anything, that just feels the whole picture as it is, feels the imbalance, whether it's in the visible or in the invisible or whatever it is. I mean, let's imagine an invisible thing is passing in the, in the room and troubling the baby, the, the mother will still wake up before and know that something is going to trouble him. So this is something beyond time and space. And then what she does will always be the right thing. The, not if she starts thinking too much, she might do the wrong thing. But the first impulse is always the right thing because it's from beyond this thing from beyond so where does it come this is an awareness beyond the perceived reality and that is the whole idea about the goddess the concept of the goddess it's not about uh, uh, a matriarchal society and the patriarchal society and male and female it's not about that at all it's about divine wisdom taking its role, playing its role in humanity, how it, it comes. So we have to have one, like I said, one of the beings always in control whenever a law, a divine law of wisdom wants to manifest. I have to have an open channel through which it can manifest. And we see that in motherhood. It's very, very evident. So that's why when we speak about the goddess, we mean we speak about this divinity because once you, what happens, and this is the same in, in all uh, mystical situations, when you bring your perceived reality in resonance with total reality. Now, your whole being is only full with this 5%, and that's me, so it's my personality. Now, I, when I enter into resonance with all this, now I'm only 5% of my being. So who is the master of the situation? Not me anymore. Somebody else bought 95% of the shares here. So the president is somebody else now. I'm just, I've become somebody who, who is just his master's voice, see. now. This is all, mysticism in all its forms is just that, is bringing the perceived in resonance with the total, and then automatically it's the total that governs, and then the perceived acts as a voice of the total. Then who is actually acting? When you act in somebody else's name, the total is acting. Now, you can name it any way you want, but this is all about divinity manifesting in humanity. It's just this. The systems could be different, the names could be different, the practice could be different, but it's just this manifesting in this. And we don't have to look that far for it because every woman here is a goddess in a way. I can't go on too much with that. I don't feel comfortable, you know, keep, <laughs> keep pushing up like that. And I, I have to discover something else, you know. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I feel, I, I see them smiling all over. <laughs> like that. And, and then, you, you know, and then I notice they start looking at us like this, you know, in the room. So <laughs> at the moment, I have to stop uh, boosting you up that way, huh? Okay. But, you know, we can do the same thing. But it takes effort. I mean, it takes a lot of effort for us to be to enter into what you have natural. Is it takes a lot of effort. That's why we need spiritual exercises. We need such things. We need so many things. Women actually don't need a quarter of what we need. For a man to reach that level, he needs. Uh, a, a lot, a, a, a lot in order to reach that. But don't we both have both in us, like male and female? Th that's why I say you, a male can activate it. Can activate. can activate it. But in the female now, we are just speaking normally. A, a female would have both of them working 
at the same time. A male would have only one working at the time. Now I can, of course, listen to music. I can do things and have the other one work. That's why also, that's one of the secrets why stress affects us more. You see? You think that, that okay, a man is stronger, but somehow women have a better constitution. Yeah. It's not because they wear us out. <laughs> yeah, we're so... No, it's not that. But remember, when both sides are working, that means you have a continuous, continuous stress release all the time. Because the right is the relaxing one, is the over one, so it's a continuous balancing of the body all the time. Now when we work on the left side, we're stressing, more stress, more stress, so we have to make an activity to de-stress. But a woman, it, it, it's, she's naturally automatically de-stressing. That's why she can take more on the long run than we can do. But we are not uh, having uh, to have a baby in us for such a long time. So I don't need to care physically for two persons, you see. But a woman has to do that, so she has to have uh, a very solid constitution. The whole universe should be working through her in order that two bodies can work perfectly in there and come out and, sh and still she's in better health and the baby's in better health and nobody's worn out, you see. So the whole system is one thing, has to, wo to work together. And this we cannot, is something you cannot interfere with. See, it's not left, we cannot interfere with. Like the beating of our hearts is something we can only interfere with very little. The, the uh, breathing. Imagine now all those things were into our perceived reality. What would happen? I am in control. I am born, they give me a manual. You know, okay, now you have to breathe so many times a minute, and you have to make your heart beat so many times, and you have to make this, and you have to make that. Now when you go up the stairs, remember, oh, now remember, increase your heartbeat, increase your breath. When you go out to school, then remember, do this and do this. Well, you know, you wouldn't live for three minutes. So we should be happy that from the total, there are laws governing all that and doing it for us. We can only uh, sort of bring an imbalance <laughs> to, <laughs> into those laws. That's, that's the best we can do. So, if I'm speaking about all that, it is the same way I want to find, now we're speaking qualitatively. Now, how can I balance a situation, an energy field. Now we're speaking about an energy system. How can I balance an energy system, whether it's architecture or healing or whatever. Everything we're speaking, energy system that is in balance needs to be balanced. How can I balance it if I'm only aware of 5% of the energy system? Now all what we are doing is trying to balance through the 5% to balance the rest. And it has to be really strong in order to balance the rest. And what we can't see is very difficult to balance, so we have to find the way. So with qualitative measurements, we have found a way now to understand the resonance in all what we cannot perceive with our senses. Now, how do I balance that? I only have a mind. If you tell me balance it any other way, I can't. Because I, I have my brain. I mean, where can I find something else to balance it with? Okay, when y you say, but you just said the woman can do those acts of wisdom when the child is there and all that. Only in certain situations where nature kicks in and forces it. But you can't depend on, on that all the time. See? You can't just listen to your wife the whole day, do this, do that, do that, do that. Oh, I, I'm, I'm wisdom on earth, you know, do this, do that. It doesn't work all day, you know. It works only in certain situations. Huh? So, we want 
to find some form if I could find a ready-made solution see some form of energy some form of thing that would just go into the energy system and balance it it's not you see let's say I have the colors in a conventional way I would say the system needs the red okay I could put some red energy into it now if I put red energy into it there is a cyclic effect I can put only so much but then at a certain limit I have to stop I can't keep on putting any of the colors and I have to make a choice and I have to make that but to decide what I need uh, is then dependent on my perceived reality and the cyclic what if something the same thing that hit the, the unconscious level of the woman in such a way and produce the proper solution what if we could find this energy quality that works in her and try to find it and find a way of using it that means our solution comes not by making something but by accessing something okay let's see how this works now to understand how this works let's take the way the Sun uh, gives us life we know we live off the Sun so why can't we just sit in the morning out there open our mouth you know and take all the life energy we need and not have to go to the supermarket and, and work and all that it would be very nice wouldn't it but it just doesn't work I don't have an organ to cap the Sun's energy imagine I live of something and I don't have the organ to cap the thing that I most need for life it's a very strange situation but so I unless I find that organ and use it I'll die I mean I have to find some how to access the Sun's energy how do I find it okay I look around me and the plant is there capturing this energy storing it so now oh, uh, if the plant can store that energy that I need to live and then I take it I eat the plant and re recapture that energy inside my body so the plant is actually my external organ because we are one life system a plant should be ta imagine l let's say somebody takes your heart or your lung and puts it out there so this is your external organ so a plant is your external organ it's what gives you the Sun's energy and it does that in a very nice way it takes the Sun's energy takes the vertical away gives you the horizontal aspect so it's actually taking it, adjusting it, preparing it for you, cooking it for you, doing something, and then you get it. You get it ready-made. Now, some plants are made for us. They do it that way. Some other plants are not made for us. They take it, and they don't cancel the vertical and all that. And these are the poisonous plants that are not made for you, that, sh that we are not, they are made for other species or things like that who need the vertical. So ants for example don't get they, they live on vertical energy there are many uh, species who can convert this very easily you go and look at uh, you stand at the electrical poles uh, there on the wires and you find the birds right up there well how come those birds go there when it's full of vertical you go and do the measurement and you find this the secret of feathers feathers have something they cancel all the vertical so you'll find the bird and around it although it's standing on an electrical thing even under it on the conductor the vertical is cancelled cats can do that 
when you know when you have uh, the in 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 Europe old ladies always when they have all those in northern Europe when they have all those rheumatic problems and all that with age that means there's a lot of vertical elimination there and they put the cats on their laps all the time it cancels the vertical with time and they feel better so you see it's so the plant does that for us and as a it's not you cannot say the plant is a separate organ you see, we, the plant and the earth, are one living system. Like I said, we are an open energy system. So we don't really need to have all the organs inside us because we are an open energy system, so it's out, outside there. Now, let us go now and see where can we find somewhere there a balancing energy like the balancing energy let, let's say when we drew the circle somewhere somewhere in the circle when I drew this there is ultimate balance here what balances it is somewhere in the center There's, you, you cannot draw a circle without the center you see so there is a quality in the center I want somewhere there there is a balancing energy okay we, uh, we spoke about the Renaissance so I, I still give you a story quick one uh, when Leonardo da Vinci he was asked to appear in front of the Pope and they wanted to see the great Leonardo uh, the Pope wanted to speak to him and see what are uh, his concepts and all that and and Leonardo was a universal genius and everything but his roots are esoteric in mystical societies and all that lately they've discovered that he was at his time the Grand Master of the Priori de Sion, which was a, a very secret movement, spiritual movement, is, but esoteric, scientific and all that. So, this explains a bit what he did. He went in front of the Pope, and there the great Renato comes in, and then he, he doesn't speak. He, sa he takes a chalk and on the wall, and makes a perfect circle and tells them to measure it. They bring something like that and go around and it's perfect. And you, you read that about Leonardo. Okay, what's so great about being able to draw a circle or a perfect circle? It needs practice. I mean, okay, a good architect could probably be able to do it. Well, but is that all about it? No. You could, I said, probably be able to do it, never 100% right. But what Leonardo was showing was you be, when you become the center of a circle, all of a sudden you radiate a spiritual power from that center that brings the balance in the whole room and then the circle just flows out. And this circle, whenever anybody looks at it, the circle will be completely alive because the center has been activated of the circle. Now that is the essence of the great Leonardo, not being able to draw a circle. So this is very important, this, if, if it can balance this, if this is the primordial balancing in nature, <coughs> why don't I call upon it to balance things? Now, let's see how it all started because today we're in a world with a thousand theories thousand religions thousand doctrines thousand things uh, that the whole thing is getting so mixed up w we don't know oh, I mean it's, it's all getting mixed up you don't know which which is which you know <laughs> everything is okay so what do we do L let's go from from the beginning let's start it completely in the beginning and try to figure out 
what happened. Maybe the there it's easier. Now, let's go to the beginning of humanity. Then we have a caveman. Let's imagine that we are cavemen. Now, a caveman would somehow, through this, remember primitive man was still right brain consciousness. He had this feeling for, for things. He could feeling of nature powers and all that. <coughs> he would notice that the branch that had the shape of a certain animal would radiate around it certain energy qualities similar to that of the animal. So just by observation, he could probably very quickly understand the whole idea of geometrical resonance, resonance between shapes and, and all that, j just li li like that, because he's not, he didn't put the barrier of the left brain consciousness. You know, sometimes the, the mind is your barrier. And he didn't have this, this barrier, he could go. The mind is the door here. You see, so he then thinks, okay, if I draw the shape of this big animal, if I draw that on the wall, and first, how do I draw it? I do like Leonardo. I imitate the animal. I make the movements of the animal, walk like the animal, make the sounds like the animal, until I feel uh, totally, my energy system, I feel I'm one with the animal. And then I take whatever chokes they're using or whatever, and then let it come out. And they have drawings of animals there on the walls that would really make a modern artist, uh, I mean, look and how can these people achieve this harmony, this motion and all that. How can they kept the whole essence of an animal in just a few lines? It's fantastic how those things, those cave drawings are. But the thing is, why should a person make a cave drawing away from the entrance of the cave? If it's inside, he can't see it anyhow. Usually, they go inside, 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 and there is a point at the center of the last area of the cave and this point usually when you go in those caves this point lies somewhere where you have like a dome shaped area inside the cave and we have a strong energy center and that's where the drawings are that's like the ceremonial area that's the, the power spot with, with a lot of energy in there so they put their drawings right there now the drawings are in resonance with the animal now they can start their hunting inside the cave. They can weaken the energy of the animal on the drawing because every time they hit the drawing with a stick or something, they see the, the energy of the animal weaken. So they keep doing that. So, and then they say, okay, well, instead of keep hitting it, I can draw an arrow into the drawing and have a permanent effect on the animal. Now, once they've weakened the animal, they go out throw a lance at the animal and then go and hide again and the animal starts bleeding they walk behind the animal slowly slowly till it gets weak falls down then they slaughter it then let's take this scenario they're following the animal the animal is very weak then it goes to drink somewhere and there is some kind of spring coming out there in a place it goes there it sits in an area they're following it and all of a sudden the animal is healthy, is standing there as if nothing happened. Very good health, regains all its power again. And they run away and they see, hey, what's with this thing? So, if let's say I come from there, I want to tell the rest of the tribe about the spot where the animal is. Now, the moment I just put my awareness there and point, you know, I before speaking there, all of a sudden, the same strange light that appeared in that spot appears around my body. <coughs> so here we are speaking about a, an energy quality in that place that the person just accessed. So you see, we're already at the origin of the first spiritual ritual. But, like I said, the word spirituality and belief and all that 
is only when the door is closed. But when the door is open, it is all in front of you, it's practical. You don't have to believe in something that you're using every day, you see. So, they sort of say, okay, let's bring somebody who's wounded, somebody who's sick, let's try to bring those people in the tub and put them in this place. Let them drink from this water and see what happens. Now, healing occurs. Now, if out of ten people, only one got cured and nine didn't, they wouldn't go back again to the place. But if you repeat it ten times and nine get cured and one didn't, then you go back. It's logical. Okay, if you repeat something so many times under the same conditions, in the same place, and get the same results, what do we call that? scientific thing. Isn't that science? Okay, so the caveman was a scientist. Yes, because science is not measurement. Science is observation, repeatability, under same conditions, getting same results. So this is science. Science is trying to understand whether you can measure it or you don't measure it. If you observe something, a phenomena, and can know what leads to it, and it's repetitive and you can repeat it, so many times, science. So through scientific methodology, they have understood the value of this spot and the value of this energy that seems to balance everything. Now, you could tell me what proves that they understood the value of that energy, that it was so important and all that. A very simple thing they would get a huge stone, maybe 30 tons. And the strange thing is, they could be near a mountain there and have stones all around them. But they would go and get the stone from maybe 300, 400 miles away. And look at the caveman who has nothing, if they decide to them this is a, an expedition going all over there and going and uh, breaking that stone loose from a mountain and then somehow pulling it and if they had a river they put it on a barge or something that means they needed wood and to move it all the distance that means that stone had something different than the stone there and then they bring it there and then they find <coughs> the center and see the center of the vortex of energy coming out they know it they find, because when underground streams cross, the vortex happens, the water is not always like that, you know, the, the stream comes out, it depends on, on so you, you get your spring here somewhere, and it also has that energy, and you have the center of the vortex somewhere. They bring that huge stone and erect it on the center of the vortex. Now, if somebody does that, he must be dealing with something that is really, really important and something that's very practical in his life. They have no time uh, for belief or something. They can, because like I said, it's, it's a wisdom thing. It's the, 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 the species spirit, it's the we. It, it's not anything individual. So they feel that they bring the stone, they put it, and then they start arranging their dwellings around it. So if we examine that stone, we find that they looked for stones that had a very high quartz content, quartz crystals in it. Why quartz? It's like your huge crystal that you have with you. Because quartz resonates, and by resonating that means it exchanges information and stores it, exchanges it, and all that. And at the same time, it is not exchanging only with us the information, but what's more important is it is somehow being charged with the information of that special light, of the special energy. And then when the quartz resonates, it radiates it. <coughs> so all of a sudden, the spot that radiated so much with this stone, it 
radiates so much. Now we can all live inside it instead of fighting for good spots, you know. So we can all live right there. Now, the history of healing, of knowledge, of what you could call today sacred activities or religion at that time, but at, that's our calling today. Then it wasn't like that. It was a practical spot that balanced everything in your life. That means wisdom. That means health. Holistic health. Not uh, just, I mean, if somebody just broke a leg somewhere, they would find a way of patching it up and doing something like that. But this was the place where your whole being changed. Okay, now since we understand that that energy is so valuable that it balances things and it does that, we want to sort of uh, take it and put it in every activity of life. Because when it goes in there and you start the activity, you're in resonance with the forces of nature and balanced by that energy, so the activity becomes completely balanced, whatever activity is in your life. So they now, from the first caveman, through thousands and thousands of years, civilization was about using this energy as a practical means of balancing every activity in your life. Bring it into your plants to get more prosperity in your plants, to bring it in your house, bring it uh, to your animals, bring it. It was all interacting with it in a very, very practical way. If I find that if I make my hand this way, then all of a sudden, the shape of my hand when I make it this way shows resonance with that light around it. Uh-oh, this is an important movement. And then I make something at a certain angle, again resonance. You see the light in my hand. This becomes an important movement. So many of the rituals that we use through history and every religion is using rituals are actually practical things from behind that door. But they didn't think, of, if you would go back then and ask the caveman, uh, oh, this is your religious ritual, what's your belief? What belief? What are you doing? Uh, I'm bringing the energy. He's just bringing the energy. Like, you're going to a stream and bring some water, and then I come tell you, what's your belief? Yeah, you say thirsty. <laughs> it's, yeah, thirsty, it's a practical thing. And that's how it is. It, it is all this, the center. And there is something about, the center has an attraction once you discover it. It has an attraction because balance is like a doorway. Now, what are the properties of this energy? First, I'll show you tomorrow the measurement of each property and how to do it and all that. But this is, you see, this is biogeometry. Biogeometry is just a design language shape, color, and sound to recreate this energy quality in space. So it takes us to something very strange. When we do Feng Shui, when we do other systems, when we do this, when we do this, we are balancing so many things, but we can only balance so much. But the people then didn't balance it. They brought the balance in it. Irrelevant what colors, irrelevant what, they brought the balance from somewhere else. In that spot was the balance. So all, how did they bring in the balance? Find a way to, now to channel this energy. Now they found that, for example, if it, a branch was thrown on the ground like that, near the area, that the energy was flowing through it. I draw a line, it somehow 
the energy just flows along the line. They make a path, and all of a sudden, it's going in the path. So now they can even go further. They can channel that energy. And when they find more than one spot, then they make a path between them, and all of a sudden, they're connected, the spots, with energy. That's what, in Europe, uh, some people refer to as ley lines. Now, the thing is, were ley lines man-made, and the energy flew, just went flying into them, or did those power spots connect, and then we put the ley lines, it doesn't really matter. Because when you walk from one to the other, you already connect them. Any motion between, so pilgrimage, roads, all, all of a sudden, they just connect those lines, you see. Now, the second thing they did was they brought uh, not one stone now, They had two systems. One system was this vertical stone here, and that's what we call today, we refer to as menhir. We call the menhir stones, the big stones. And then there's another thing that they did. They got two of those stones, erected them like that, and brought a third one just as big and put it up here. That's for a caveman who, I mean, if they found a rat to eat, it would be a feast. I mean, really harsh conditions of life. And they would go and do this, put 30 tons on those. How did they do that? Okay, to erect that, you tell me, okay, they just made the whole whatever they do. Erecting 30 tons is not an easy stuff. But doing two of them and putting one on top, it is really a lot. And then, I always wondered, what is this gateway? It's like a gateway. They always put it on the spot of energy where the stream was, when the stream was coming up, the water was coming up. Sometimes on the vortex itself, sometimes in the sea, but I wondered, what, what this shape can do. So, I just wrote three pieces of wood, like that, and made this gateway. And then I started measuring energies on both sides. I found nothing. I mean, I wanted to see, analyze the shape, irrelevant of the spot first. I mean, why did they choose this shape? Of course, on the spot, it would show the properties of the spot. But I wanted to see, why did they choose the shape? So I kept turning it right, left, right. I went through the whole 360 degrees to see in every degree what, how is it interacting. And then as I went somewhere, just between the east and the south, just southeast, I found that it radiated a very strong radiation. All of a sudden, an energy came out like that from both sides, as if all of a sudden, something is coming through it on both sides. With the same quality of energy as the power spot. Now, and that you can do, I mean, you can create a power spot here on, on this table or in your garden with a pergola. Just take something like this, turn it in the right direction, and all of a sudden you, you have this thing shoot. I started looking at all. This is named uh, dolmen, by the way. They call that dolmen. Now, I looked at all the dolmens in Europe, and all of them are oriented in that direction. Now, that is also the basis of all the great churches of Europe, of the orientation of all the great churches in Europe. They are all related to that direction because they are based on the same principle of the caveman. The same dolmen the caveman put there 
became later on either the gateway to the church or, or something developed into a church or was somewhat the center of a church or so but this was done by the cavemen I mean imagine that by they knew all that now that means when he put that on the water he knew now that he had something that gave similar qualities of energy like the one in the spot so he could even amplify the energy of the spot with this now what are the components that we are going to study tomorrow in detail I'll just mention them of that energy here first of all this energy has a communication property it has carrier waves coming out of it those spots they are radiating li li like uh, any television station it's, they're just radiating so when you go into this spot it, you can radiate your thoughts you can, you can receive you can connect it's a very strong communicative property in this area communication with a slight nice touch to it it is not limited to this dimension not limited to time and space completely independent it can communicate between dimensions it can communicate its communication multi-dimensional communication now that is the reason that these spots started first of all the spot itself started interacting with the with your energy field so this man here in the spot when you went in the spot interacted interacted means information exchange within a very short time all the information of the subconscious of all the people there were stored in the stone the whole collective unconscious there was stored in the stone now that stone once it had this very strong energy could interact with you now in Latin in, in Europe you find in many old books they call it the genius loci genius is like the genie loci is of the location so that means it's the spirit of the place but the spirit of the place is the collective spirit of all the people who lived around it and who built it now this spirit of the place <coughs> has one advantage over the people its energy is balanced continuously you see by because it's their subconscious placed in the center of the vortex being purified and balanced and strengthened all the time so everybody in the tribe started getting the power the balance and everything so naturally whenever there was a problem you would go back to the stone for balance and that's when people say they went for oracles they went for this or it's it's not that it's a practical thing it's not belief mystical okay it's not belief it's a reality I mean we'll now this is one aspect the second aspect was the first one was communication the second one was balance like we said before it just seems to balance all energy systems whether it's emotional mental uh, health everything seems to be automatically balanced by that plus there was a very strange thing there there was a sort of a very calming uh, light in the ultraviolet violet ultraviolet range that's manifested in those spots it's like the light that accompanies dawn in the morning and this light is very receptive or it's very similar and it's in resonance to the angelic dimension so angelic entities can easily manifest in this place so all of a sudden the doorway was a doorway to multiple dimensions where you could actually interact with the nature powers 
because angels are nature powers. So you could interact with all the nature powers through this doorway. So it's a doorway to the beyond, but a doorway that balanced. You couldn't have uh, a harmful elemental or entity or something come through that doorway because you have the purifying energy, the balancing energy. So you can only have good in that doorway. Now, this is the basis of all civilizations and of all knowledge and of all sciences. Anything else is off balance. Okay. Now, this has developed into the obelisks that you find in Egypt and that we graciously gave you as presents to put in Washington, to put in Paris, to put in London. <laughs> okay, but you know, there's a very big problem. An obelisk has no meaning unless you have the power spot and you have it on it. So you can't just take it there and put it there. It doesn't work. It's a whole thing, you know. And so here, this developed into obelisks, later on towers of all kinds, your belt tower, your church tower, every kind of tower of all kinds, you know, towers were labeled in history as, or obelisks and towers, since the time of the pharaohs, they were lived at the fingers of God. Now, they must be on the spot with which to interact. Because one hand alone doesn't clap. You have to have the spot and then you have to have the architectural thing on it. So, ancient architecture. And, you know, architecture is the mother of all arts. Not just because I'm an architect. <laughs> they say that. Huh? Okay, it's the mother of all arts. And it's where, and it's, now a few things. I said so much about women, now a bit about architects. Huh? Okay, the mother of all arts. The mirror of civilization. Okay, so in architecture, you have, I mean, how can you go back and understand ancient cultures, ancient things through ancient monuments? That's the mirror of civilization. And if that is the mirror of civilization, then it's this light, this energy quality that is the basis of all civilization. And people dealt with it in the temples, of course. So people didn't understand it. But I can show you that all along the line, there were people who knew. And every important movement is based on something related to that light. Although you might not know it straight away, but someone knew it. Now, this is the gateway, the gateway to the temples, the most important gateways in the temples, if, if you read uh, about all the ancient temples, the eastern gate seems to have a certain, uh, uh, always influence, a certain importance of the eastern gate, because that was the most important gate. Now, so this east-west link, or in reality it was a bit not uh, east exactly, but you, you go down about five degrees or seven degrees below it. This, it could fluctuate a bit from one place to the other, but it's always in that range between <coughs> east and southeast. Th this is where you adjust. So if you uh, have, let's say, uh, a garden, you could get a pergola and just keep turning it in between east and southeast until you get this energy quality. Now, what if it's pointing away from your house then? We said, 
that energy flows, once you have it in the right direction, it flows along linear objects. So what if I do this? I make a path and then turn it, and maybe my house is in this direction. The energy will go like that and go in the house. So you can actually, because we will not call it now spiritual energy, we will take something very neutral. It, it's, let's call it the all balancing energy or something, or the biogeometrical quality or something like that. This is this thing that balances everything. Now, No, not, you see, we will go sunrise, sunset, and all that, and the colors, and that. We'll go that into that tomorrow morning, uh, the colors, the angles to the earth, and the sun, and, and all that. Uh, no, this is, if something is the center of, the, remember I said the center of the circle, that means it's a vortex beyond time and space. So it cannot be uh, uh, linked to uh, the angles of the sun and all that. Let's say if you take the components, and every component taken separately can be reproduced by the angles of the sun. But then you put them together and you don't get this. This is, the components are beyond time and space. It's something that comes out here and is not affected by anything within our time and space. The only thing here, the whole design language must be based on one important criteria that, that you can see here, and that is create a center. You see, you have to be interact with the center because the center is beyond time and space. And centers exist everywhere. Every, every, it's, we create them. So we need this balancing energy. Now, sometimes this goes into all architecture. Now this is, you know, th the gateways, the Arc de Triomphe, like in Paris, all those gateways that you have in history. Okay, th this is not just a gateway like that. When, like in Paris, the Arc of Triomphe is, uh, uh, symbolizes victory. When an army went somewhere, they would create this gateway in a proper direction, have the spiritual element through it. So that means that this sort of, uh, when they conquer the place, when they're going in the place, it's a divine mission. It is balanced with their protected, their prosperity and everything in the new place they're going by this energy. And this symbolizes their victory is actually given. So they couldn't believe that anything was possible without this connection. You see, without a balancing energy, nothing is possible in your life. It has this one, this one, it has to do with the angles and you will learn that with color placement we are going to work <coughs> with angles. But it's not necessarily the rotation of the earth. It's l like underground rivers, they cross at certain angles. Certain angles produce those vortices that are very positive. Other angles produce the other negative vortices that bring cancer. What do you mean, neutral? The quality of the it's it, it changes the it, No, it's, it's all balancing. It just balances anything. If something is overactive, it brings it down. If something is underactive, it, it will, at the same, t let's say, I'm radiating red energy at you because I'm doing color, uh, color therapy and I find this very good. I'm radiating red energy because you have, let's say, uh, a low function of thyroid or whatever and I want to raise it. But maybe your stomach is overactive. So you see, so while I'm doing one thing, I could be disrupting another one. That's the mind working. 
So you say, okay, I do this, then I do that, then I do that. So every healer has his system of doing this and then rebalancing. So you have to, do, to go through a system to achieve healing, and the good healer will get better results th than another one. But then if you go and stand on such a spot, you don't need anything because it will go in, what's overactive will become normal, what's underactive will become normal, everything will be balanced for you. And it will be balanced from be beyond time and space, from the total energy. That means the 90% I don't see, because you can only see your organs. But what if there are imbalances on levels that you don't see? What if a chakra, and your own chakra exists on the body and above the body, and they're not all in the body? What if the imbalance is outside the body? You can't see. So when you access that energy, it balances from the physical to everything. So why should we, now we found the thing that balances everything. Why should we live without it? Now, when they built a town in ancient times, they used to do this. They used to look for a spot. Now we find a spot here. Okay. This spot would be the place where they built their sacred building. So they built a sacred building, their temple. Now, temple in that time, we call it a place of worship now. But like I said, they did not think of religion, they, it was practical. So temple was house of knowledge. It was house of health, but holistic health, holistic knowledge. So when there were some worldly things that you could learn outside the temple. There were some uh, worldly ways of treatment outside the temple. But I'm saying here on the higher level, on the higher level of wisdom teaching, teaching that you access, you see, was found there. So they imagine is all civilizations had the teaching that you learned and the teaching that you access. Now, we forget about that. But you would go, and this is the word Pharaoh in Egypt, comes from the word Per, Anch. Per means house, Anch, life, the house of life. This is Pharaoh. And this house of life was actually the place, the house of knowledge. And it was attached to the temple. It was part of the temple complex. So this type of knowledge was a knowledge based on connection. It's exactly what the mystics are, are doing today, this connection with the lower, with the upper. But that was a way of life. It wasn't just one mystic doing it, it was a way of life. And the, once you were connected, Peran, house of life, also means life from its source, the way it's given, and it means also that this connection is so important that the name Perang is one of the names given to the ruler, to the, and that's Pharaoh comes from that, Perang, and we say uh, today, we simplify it and say the Pharaoh. Th that means the Pharaoh was the person who was most connected with, through the doorway, with wisdom, with divine knowledge, and through this connection he brought prosperity to the country. You see? So it, it was a practical thing, a temple was a practical thing. Now, we would look somewhere here and find another spot. Connect them with the main avenue. So you see here, my city planning is coming out of the earth. I'm not inventing a city plan, and that's very important. Today, we draw plans of areas, irrelevant of what's happening there. No, it does, they grew their plans out of the earth. Now, here, what would I put here? Maybe the Pharaoh's palace, to make sure he was balanced all the time and got a lot of power and a lot of wisdom. Then maybe I look somewhere else here and find another place. Then I could put, let's say, the courthouse 
that's where I need w with the most and maybe in another spot here somewhere I would have the marketplace to bring prosperity to everything we did and w once I have my two or three spots then first of all we start doing the connections Co connecting those spots like this one way or the other and I have a basic layout of the city then comes the next step those roads are the distribution lines of this energy now I want to bring them into every house into every room because everyone wants to to live in it like the cavemen they went around them in here so we start the secondary uh, roads now you see something now I did an orthogonal thing the secondary roads why because when choosing the secondary road they looked at energy lines in the earth because I want connectivity and they use them also they plan their roads on those energy lines so now they can actually distribute it everywhere and because the energy grids in the earth and that we'll learn tomorrow in anesthesia the energy grids of the earth they are sort of orthogonal lines they can we have something like this this is about two meters times 250 in feet what would that be six times seven feet or something like that and then you have another grid that you can find this is called Hartmann grid because it's uh, it, it was uh, discovered by Hartmann in Germany in uh, I think around 1935 or something like that those Germans were very clever huh, Helmut? <laughs> and and then there's another diagonal grid which is called the Wittmann he discovered it but it's known under the name of Curry also grid there are two Germans and this is the, the first one is Hartmann and these are communication grids on, on the earth so why don't I use them in my planning because today we architects we come we take a piece of paper and then start making squares on it and this is my modular shape and then start designing a house from where does this model come nowhere in ancient times they used to get people to find those lines they would trace the grid and they were called these people were called ogres in Rome ogres were people who had a staff I'll show you pictures of, of ogres uh, tomorrow when we go into radiesthesia and see the instruments you see the pictures of the instruments of radiesthesia once we, we start on radiesthesia but it's they were standing with stuffs like that and the stuffs were crooked at the end like this or spiral and all or most of the saints that you find in Christian Europe were actually ogres what's an ogre? They, they, they weren't just the word saint wasn't just a holy man no it was the, a man of knowledge that means he had his stick and he could find the spot he could find the energy lines he would set the proportions for for the sacred building mainly they were building sacred buildings so these people were carriers of the secrets of sacred buildings and they would hold their stick like this now if I knew the wavelength of water I would if it was that long I would hold my stick here and have this exactly the wavelength of water and then walk on the ground and while I'm walking the moment this tip when I hit does this I'm on water because I have the wavelength of water if I have the wavelength of gold wavelength of this wavelength of so the stick was 
this stuff was a very important thing. Now the cardinals and popes hold them and they don't know what to do with them, you see. <coughs> yeah, th they think they're symbols. But in ancient times, nothing was there for a meaning, for a symbol. All these were instruments, were devices, were energy devices. And the, you would find uh, all those people mainly related to building decoration, things like that, of those things. You would get people, they first find the grid, and now we ask ourselves, wh where is the origin of orthogonal architecture, square and rectangular rooms? Here. Because they rose from the grids of the earth. Because many people now, some modern architects, say, oh, why do they always make square rooms and, and think when th these shapes don't exist in nature? Because the earth has square, if you could wear certain glasses to see the grid, you would see in this room cubicles, that thick walls, and we are actually walking from one room to the other. There, there exists an invisible uh, sort of structure, multi-story. <coughs> so it's, th there's a German called Banker, and he called it the Banker cube system. So they're actually cubes that you go from one to the other. So when they built architecture, they used those cubes to align the walls. They used them to align the horizontal ceilings and grounds. So you didn't need surveying instruments, because if you detected one plane, you could detect the horizontal there, so y they use that for surveying. And, for example, if they, the Great Pyramid in Egypt is built like this, and the base, I mean, is something like that. Now, logically, when you build something of the size of the Great Pyramid, you would first sort of flatten the base in order to be able to see what's on the other side when you make surveys. You see, you can't make a survey if you have a hill in the middle and you don't see the other side. It's not logical to build the building before clearing this and making a perfectly flat surface and then you start your building. They didn't do that in the pyramid. So we wonder how come they created all this? Did they have, even with laser, you need something to go through that. But it's very easy. You had, you measure, see where the grid goes in, the horizontal one, and you have a level. When it goes out, you have a level. So you can use it for surveying the base. So architecture arose from the ground, and this is how cities were made. Now, if you do this, you are sure that you have this energy in every activity of your life. Now, we have buildings to interact with it, cities to interact with it, and then they looked at, now, like I said, how can I as a human being interact with it? Like I said, when I pointed at it like that, I found that I somehow entered into resonance. When I bring, make my hand like this, automatically I enter into resonance. When I do this, so all of a sudden, we learned a set of actions and rules and sounds and chanting and voice things and all that, we started finding out what actions we can do in every aspect of our life that produced this type of energy. So this is the secret of sacred chanting in the temples. It is using two special notes. You know, you, you get it from the bottom there and from the dome inside your mouth in such a way that you create a certain link there and then all of a sudden you produce the same energy in a power spot. So you can produce it. There are many ways to produce it, not only architectural, but that's the basis of everything uh, in life. Now, there's a step beyond that. Now, they, Pythagoras is telling us that they used something else there. <coughs> he said that they used a certain proportion. And this is called the golden rule. That this was the proportion that they used, and it's a proportion of beauty. 
it's a proportion of growth, it's a proportion, I mean, they used it in everything, they stuck to it. And until lately, and even till now, uh, in the first year of architectural studies, they have to pass through classes where when they study all the Greek forms and Greek columns and all that, they have to construct them using the golden rule, which is 1 to 1.68. It's, it's a ratio like this. And lately, this proportion has been revived again by all artists and has been called sacred geometry. In reality, it, wasn't, it isn't sacred geometry. In reality, it was called the, the canons of architecture. The word canons, uh, if you see the old Roman books of Vitruvius and all that, they say the canons means the laws. And they speak about this proportion. Now, when they would say this is proportion of spirituality and beauty, so we start, and you find this proportion used in every type of sacred monument and architecture through history till today. Not exactly today. <laughs> Very near. Okay. We decided all of a sudden, I mean, no, creativity, art, you know, that when we started abstract art and things like that. Why learn from nature? Why do things like that? Why don't I just bring out what's inside me? So now I want to make a building. Why stick to rules? Why stick to something? Why don't I just let my design thing go free and create a building the way it comes out and all that? So proportions, rules, and all things that they only restrict, and we took all that away from architecture. Yeah, okay, we didn't know what it was what we were taking away. Now, you want the 30 second course or one minute course in sacred geometry? The one minute. Okay? One minute to understand what it really is. Okay. Now time me. I'm putting stones on the ground. I'm just throwing stones like that on the ground. And when I throw 16 stones, the energy quality around the stones is the same as a spiritual power spot. It's the quality of number. The stone creates all the properties in a spiritual power spot. So, this is the secret of the quality behind the number 16. The quantity 16 has the, is the other side of its coin is the quality of spiritual power spots. So now, of course, if you wanted to amplify a spiritual power spot, you would make a building with 16 doors, 16 windows, 16 columns, and all that. Then you'd amplify it. But then, it wasn't very practical. So we thought, okay, I can't say I take 16 inches, because nature doesn't understand inches, centimeters. What does nature understand? proportions. So I if I can transform the 16 to a proportion, if I bring a line that is equal to any 10 units, whatever, and beside it another line <coughs> equals 16, then the proportion energy-wise, nature could feel, you see, a support proportion between two things. And this, in architecture, they thought, okay, if we use the proportion 1 to 1, 0.6 or 10 to 16 it would give me the same I'm still holding the energy quality of the number 16 okay and then so I'd okay, finish the lesson sacred geometry you don't need more than that because that's the essence of sacred geometry now you go into a sacred geometry diagram it's very complex Anywhere you produce a vortex. Now you, now you got the, the one minute uh, sacred geometry? You know, sometimes when you condense things into the one minute thing, it's easier to follow. L like when you know, when we did the, the, the energy key, the one minute energy key, it explains you all what, you can just put 
all what you have from Feng Shui in there and sort of start uh, finding for yourself uh, all the answers. And when you have, now when you know this, you can start finding so many answers, so many things for yourself because you know now the power is not in the proportion itself. The power is in the quality of quantity. That means in ancient Egypt, in ancient times, like I told you, they just came out of the door and the door is still open. So when they started to develop a system of numbers, a system of uh, whatever geometrical system of anything, even a system of astronomy, all systems they started to develop were in the beginning just a sort of a manifestation of what was on the other side. They didn't develop them for their own sake. They didn't develop a uh, number just to, uh, for commercial re reasons when they went to the market. I mean, uh, because of course, w when you go to the ancient Egyptian civilization, you're going to find, okay, they had coins, they had money, they had everything, they had a very sophisticated administrative and economical system and all that but that arose later on it shouldn't somehow distract us from the fact that in the temples they knew that the real thing was not the quantitative for example when they put the scribe the royal scribe sitting and he is writing on papyrus and then they speak about the king and they give him a title and one of the titles is the scribe now would you give a king today the title of uh, of let's say uh, of an accountant or something would it give him pleasure i mean he already has the title of a king okay what but the title scribe might mean something totally different than somebody writing your letters for you, you see. So scribe was he who used to sort of use the letters or the writing in conjunction with manipulation of the forces of nature. So it's somebody who had so much power. So of course, if you could use letters to interact with the forces of nature, then it is such an honor to be called scribe. See, and that's how it was. So numbers is the same thing. Every number has a personality. Now if I put two stones on the table, three stones on the table, I have an energy of number, energy field around it, energy quality. Now this energy quality, on the physical level, it shows quantity. On the physical, you can just count them and it shows quantity. But what you don't see is the vitality level is there. It affects the vitality of the area. What you don't see around that is an emotional level, a mental level, a spiritual. But if around the number you could measure all the levels, that means that number is alive. Because having emotions and mental and all that, it means it's alive. Now, if, an, if it has all those levels, that means it's a personality. It's a living personality. So you're accessing the soul of the number. You're accessing the personality of the number. And every number has this total personality of the number. When you just access the numerical aspect, you're accessing just the physical. So here, one of the ways of producing the sacred energy quality was for somebody who knew the numbers was using the number 16. So there are two numbers that produce that energy quality. One used in architecture, that's 16, and one used in many esoteric works, and that's the 19. So you'll find that they use 19 and 16. 19, yes. But we haven't, uh, we've discovered the use of 19 in many old scriptures, but nobody uh, looked for it in, in architecture, but probably it's there too. Does that have the same effect as uh, It's a bit more powerful, slightly more powerful. In a way, yes, and in a way, no. 
because 16, you could say 1 and 6 become 7. But 7, but it's on higher octave, imagine to be on higher octave, but 7 has only one uh, property and that's communication. It doesn't have the balance, it doesn't have all the other components of the spiritual spots. The 16 has them, has all the components. So if you make 16, 1 and 6, and you make a 7, it, it, like I said, to have one component but not all the rest. So you can't do the same thing like numerology, you have to do uh, measurements here. Now, this is what? Massive related to measurements, the number 16, not necessarily what they do in numerology, where they take names. No, no, you measure the, the energy it's quality the around it, yes. Okay. Now, let's go a bit further about this energy quality that we are going to use, this biogeometrical energy quality. And let's slowly go into methods, what is a design language of shape that accesses it. It must be something, a design language related to accessing the center. Some something always in accessing an invisible center somehow. So I'll give you some ideas why start developing something without looking for it in nature because nature must use that language. Now, if I look at the earth here and I see on the horizon of the earth or not necessarily the horizon, any, take any two different materials. At, where, at the boundary between two materials, you could imagine if they're vibrating, then there is a certain friction between boundaries. So wherever you have a boundary, you have out of that boundary a communication wave coming out. And this communication wave is very similar to the energy quality of the number seven. So all boundaries of things have the quality of the seven, all boundaries. Now, here, this energy of communication, let's say on the beach, you have water and sand. In old uh, England, the witches, in order to get a lot of energy in their body. You needed this communication energy to go through the fat layers of the body and give you a lot of energy. So they would go on that spot in a full moon and on that spot exactly between the water and where the friction is and they would dance naked on the beach here. Why dance naked on the beach? Because they want to expose as much body fat, the fat layers, they want to expose it to the energy so it gets it stores it inside and the whole body is radiating of that energy stored in the fat. So they dance naked and then afterwards when the energy is stored, they cover the whole thing into a cloak or something it's to keep it in, you see? And so there's always boundaries between things are places that are very, very important. When two boundaries cross like that, if you have a crossing of two things like that, then you get a vortex automatically. So it's even a more potent thing. Now, but this still doesn't give me any boundary like the horizon. I look at the horizon, I feel well, I like to look at the horizon, but it doesn't have the three or the, com usually we look at this energy with three components. It's, it doesn't have all three components at the horizon. Why? Because when I look at the horizon, I am not really aware my awareness does not go to the center. The center of the earth is too far away. And I'm here, you see. So there's no awareness of the center. Now, let's go a bit further. Mountains. When you have a mountain, see what this shape a mountain, I, I'll call this shape 
the interface concept interface when one goes into the other the earth goes into the sky or a bay or something what happens here when I do this I have drawn the center here so you see the center becomes near not in the center of the earth but the shape itself has a new center in there <coughs> and so in an interface you will find here a very strong spiritual power spot in the center here and that's about the whole all the stories of sacred mountains of Moses going up the mountain of Muhammad going up the mountain of all the prophets going up the mountains in all religions something has to do with mountains sacred mountains and sacred mountains is because they go somewhere that has a very strong power spot or we can take it the opposite way what if the mountain has a cave inside it so I have a double interface even more powerful that's why if you play with puzzles you get a very strong spiritual energy in your body because puzzles you know somehow you can sit for hours and enjoy puzzles so when you start putting them together like that this interfacing this interfacing you start feeling spiritual energy and you feel very relaxed with puzzles now you could have the opposite you could have a valley and you also have sacred valleys because any shape like this brings the center near so the idea is just any interface any change that brings in a center it could be you could have a bay like that or a peninsula you would always if you have a seashore and then a bay you'd always tend to be drawn to the bay or a seashore and the peninsula tend to be drawn to it there there is something there and this is the interface principle and here you have a double interface principle and you can find in all ancient buildings whether they end up the wall this way or end up the wall of things like that like you find in many buildings in the Middle East you see the top of the walls they have those decorations on the top of the walls because this is the interface you see the positive is equal to the negative and when you have an interface then automatically you have the spiritual energy flowing inside the wall a connection between the earthly and the divine up and so you see this is interface so you see there are many ways of connecting to it the whole idea is connecting to a center now we have a very uh, potent biogeometrical shape in biogeometry and it it is like this now here I am we have an awareness of an invisible center here but if you touch it you lose it you see if you have if you draw a cross like that then in the center here you'd expect a cross must have it's one of the geometrical shapes again that radiate that interacts with the components because the cross comes from ancient Egypt where in 3000 BC it was it, it it looked like that very much like the Templar cross and its name was the Neds the word Neds means savior because it's it's savior and like as you know that uh, Jesus Christ came to Egypt as a child and he grew up in Egypt so the linking of the cross with Christianity came from all the Gnostics uh, in Egypt who started reviving again the the sign of the cross so you find the cross in ancient Egypt 
in the Middle Kingdoms and all that, don't find it that much. And you find it again with the Gnostics about 300 uh, BC. The cross comes out again in this shape. Now, the, there's a very strange thing here. The cross here has a circle here. Because if you don't have a circle, if you're drawing that, like, if you draw it like that, you are touching the center too much. And you don't have the components anymore. But when you come like that and then draw, so you're, the center is still there, it's encircling it, you're not putting. The moment you put a point, if you draw a circle like that, you have the three components coming out here, those components of spirituality. If you come and say, this is my center and put a point, you lose it. Because the center is a shape, again, that has a center. So it's elusive. The center just seems to vanish away into another center. So you shouldn't, you should point to the awareness of the center without touching the center. And with this idea, we have here this geometrical shape. And this is a biogeometric shape that recreates the energy of a power spot, I mean, on your body. Now, the first thing we are going to ask now, okay, why should we uh, revive all that? I mean, wh why should we, in first place? What will it do? for us today, whether I use interfaces in my building, whether I revive centers, whether, what, why should I do that? Hmm? Okay, somebody can ask, yeah, why, why should I? I'm very happy with what I'm doing, why should I? Because we said in the beginning, unless you can find the solution to our main problems, electromagnetic fields, to earth radiation, to all those things, whatever you're doing is not worth it. So, the first thing you're going to ask me, now, it's, well and done, we sat with you now for two days, we heard some nice stories, some nice things, but unless this thing has validation, uh, I mean, we, we can't really see the effect, I want to see validation of, of what happens when I introduce this balancing energy into something, like I said, you introduce in all our activities. Okay, show me an example of using it in the activity to convince me that this was really the most important thing, this energy principle, this balancing thing, is so important that it is the center of all architecture of all life through the ages. Show me some validation. When, when you are doing something that important, we shouldn't go the way of most alternative sciences who shy away from validation because Many people in alternative sciences will tell you why should I start doing validation because a homeopath, for example, will tell you, okay, we are treating uh, according to uh, an energy principle, like amplifying the energy of the immune system, like treating like with like to accentuate the systems of the immune system and all that, and then when I give a remedy, the remedy is actually if it's water or alcohol, there's nothing in it, it's just energy. Now, to explain that, to give that in a laboratory, and they test it, and they tell you it's water or it's energy. So from the beginning, I mean, why should I spend my time uh, speaking to somebody who speaks a totally different language? And I've seen that happen all over the world with homeopaths. They go to the laboratories of the Minister of Health, they, they catch a medicine here from the shelf and one here and all that, and they put it there and they tell them this is pure water, there's nothing in it, or this pure alcohol, this is fraud. I mean, they don't understand that about the energy principle. So people tell you, why should I go to the, let's say, conventional orthodox medicine to let them test what I am doing? Because I know they're against it to, from the beginning, you see. But we should not act like that. Because, remember, somebody standing in the mainstream, if you shy away from convincing him just because 
they will attack you or something like that, you will never jump in in the mainstream. So we have to, to do validation here. The first thing is, w when I started doing by geometry, how do you validate? You start validating by showing how we can uh, use it to balance things that we know are problematic, whether it's human health, whether it's uh, plants, whether it's animals, whether it's that, show something. Uh, in Egypt, they asked me to join uh, a national liver project for hepatitis C research. And they were comparing chemical drugs like interferon and things like that, very strong chemotherapy with herbal medicines, with some Chinese herbs and all that. They were, I mean, they wanted to know what is available for virus C because th there's no cure for that. Some people get cured, but at the end, uh, it's a very uh, detrimental disease. So they thought, okay, uh, he, he, this guy is an architect. He has no idea what the virus C is. So he'll probably come with his shapes and think that with some geometrical shapes, he can cure people <laughs> who, have, who need a liver transplant. I mean, let him come and, uh, uh, and try something like that. And at that time, uh, I mean, I was speaking, you know, judge working environment, working spaces and that. And when they come and tell me, okay, they send me a letter, you have to join the hepatitis C research program and show what biogeometry can do. So send us the remedy that we're going to use. So I thought, well, I can't send you anything because I go into the person's home, balance the colors, balance this, balance this. I don't have a, a, a medicine. They said, no, we saw you give rings and, and give things to people and they get cured. So I said, yes, but we have my signatures and we analyze every person's energy. Then we engrave them with an engraver on his ring or something like that. So it's very personal. I mean, it's nothing that can come in a big research project. And they said, no, we want 300 of y your rings or something. And at that time, I, a com computer specialist friend of mine told me, well, you know what, we can take your signatures, and if you will not have the possibility to sit with the people to see what they need, because every person is individual, I can take about three or 400 of those signatures and sort of make them very small on the computer and give them according to computer technology, the way they make integrated circuits and, and chips, and said we'll put them in uh, on the computer, and then we'll have aluminum chips and the laser will go out and on the anodization, and we will make so, sort of laser imprinted chips for you. And th they should actually, when you put all the 200, so everybody will take what he wants exactly like the computer. You have all the functions in there, and everybody can, uh, can use what he wants. So I thought, okay. Uh, let's try it. And we made those chips. Uh, they were aluminum chips like that. And we sent 300 of the chips to, uh, to this. It was the pharmaceutical department of a, uh, who was doing the research. So they were biased to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I sent it there. And then uh, they told me the pharmaton, and uh, not interferon. Interferon was the most potent one. It was the chemotherapy, but it was the one that really, at the end, uh, was most effective. But the problem is that you needed a certain level of immunity to take it, and if you take it, your immunity will drop, so half the people will fall out on the way. So the results of, were around, usually when you read results about interferon, they tell you, okay, 50% cure. But it's 50% of the ones who are left not of the ones who are discarded on the way. And it ends up that really uh, it's about 25% uh, cure in there. And they told me if you manage anywhere above 20%, you should be okay because you'll be above the herbal remedies, above such things. You should be okay uh, with that. I said, I don't know, that's not the way I work. If I don't have the opportunity to go to somebody's house to see if there's earth radiation under his bed, to see, I mean, all that, how can I, uh, I work? And so we said, oh, I said, I'll give it a try. But, but you know, there, it's uh, b because I work 
as an architect, I build lots of uh, projects for the government. I do all that. So I cannot just back out of anything. It's either you have it or you don't have it, if it's serious or not serious. So we went into the project. And at the end of about the, the first uh, two weeks, they were doing the first test, first results. And we had a 90% result with biogeometry. So everything immediately everything went upside down, you know. And the dean went once and he said it on, on TV and, and something that uh, Ibrahim got with us at the university, 90%. And so I told them at the end, don't, you, you say 90% and don't expect the 90% to go down to about 60 or 70% because we didn't do the, the whole thing. Because if this guy goes back and sleeps, his bed is still on, on Earth radiation. Or if he's a pilot and, and in the middle of all those electromagnetic fields and all that, but they didn't want to listen to all that. You see, when you just want that minded, okay, look, they said, okay, you just, we got the 90%, okay, thank you. And just don't bother us with, with what is going to become less if I don't see their homes or if I don't see what, <laughs> forget about all that. And it's this that we have to go through by showing design, very simple geometrical design using color and shape can bring, can make such a huge difference in something that is really important and then the people start listening to you. Then you can build houses that way, you see, but first validate it in something that really matters. If termites are in the building, does that mean there's bad energy? Mm -hmm. Because in Florida, it's, it's a very... Um I know there is uh, uh, one of the people who were with us uh, last year here is called uh, Vince Kubilius and he had termite problem in his house and he corrected the termite problem with just two you know those little uh, round stickers like that the very very tiny ones that you don't very very small he got a green one and the red one and placed them in the right place and once he got his energy there, his house was free of termites. You learn that. You learn that tomorrow. Little dots like that. You, you learn how to do that. Now, once he did it, the house was free of termites. He, he got another problem, and he told me his wife was mad at me for the other problem, <laughs> that he the, the pigeons started coming <laughs> around the house, and so every day she had to clean the balcony. But uh, I told him, look, once you make a spiritual power spot, I mean, pigeons, is, it's a nice thing. And he said, yes, but w not when my wife has to clean every day. But at least he got rid of the termites. And then uh, Jared, who's a friend of his, who, who was also having problems with uh, insects, little spiders and ants in the house and outside the house, he placed two uh, dots, very small dots of color. Of course, you don't have to go... This needs very good fine-tuning if you want to solve a big problem with just two dots. But he managed to do it, two dots of colors in, in the house and two corners inside the house, and two dots of colors on the extremity uh, of the side. With the first ones, he completely cleared his house of ants, of spices, if nothing came in. Then he did the one in the garden, and they stopped coming uh, in, in that area. So you could, you see... Uh, well, that's it. Earth radiation is crossings. Oh, it is? Yeah. It's the same thing. But don't take that, I mean, every time you find ants that you say, I have earth radiation because ants could come if you leave some sugar around. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Can you um, discover these energy spots by not being at the site? Can you do it from a floor plan or from a site plan? Or do you need to do that? No, we usually like to work away from the site. Yes, I mean, first I work on a map, I work on some. You're going to, to learn tomorrow when you go thre through radiesthesia how to work at a distance because I said that time and space really don't matter. So uh, if I wanted to test uh, if I have earth radiation uh, under your bed, let's say, 
it's, it's very easy to do when you're here. I don't have to go there. I could just do it and tell you uh, how to correct it. So uh, we'll do that uh, tomorrow. I'll show you how to work and do things at a distance. The thing is, today, uh, and we've achieved a sort of a, a change in our way of looking at things. Now, tomorrow, we start, we have three days of radiesthesia. The first day is the concepts, how we study the instruments, the theoretical background and all that. And then the second and third day, we are going to apply that in everything uh, that you do. You're going to apply that when it comes to uh, things choosing by signatures, uh, whatever uh, you do. Now we spoke about uh, biosignatures. Let me give you a word or two about biosignatures. Biosignatures here are a way of interacting with the body in uh, I want, l l let's say I have my balancing energy come in. Now I want to pass through the fat layers of the body. You know that the fat layers of the body, they store energy. And they store energy, that means they protect your energy system. It's like the insulator around the wire. You know, if you have a wire, if you didn't have the insulator, then my hand would come, and if I bring it near any uh, electrical thing like that, let, let's say here I have the mic, and there's a field around it, I bring my hand around the mic, it, it would fall, I wouldn't be able to move it. You see, it's, it would just fall down. Now, because something would be disturbing the whole, because the wires here wouldn't be shielded. Now, but I can move it because they're insulated. I'm completely insulated. My energy system cannot be, I can't just pass beside something and all of a sudden lose my energy to it. No, I'm ins insulated. And this insulation doesn't mean that I'm a closed energy system because I'm totally insulated. I have windows windows inside the, the, the shielding and they are the acupuncture points, they are the chakra points and all those windows and the windows, what are windows for in a house? This is the 20 second uh, uh, acupuncture lesson, okay? In 20 seconds only, from the architectural <laughs> point of view. <laughs> huh? no. Windows are made so that you look and see what's happening outside the house. So. Yeah. The same thing, your energy system is closed, shielded, but it wants to see what's happening outside. So your system can interact and balance itself with what is happening in the whole universe from the distant star to here. Your system, you're an energy system that can, must take into consideration all that. And so it has windows to look, so it's looking outside and through those windows it is in constant harmony, in constant balance with all that. Now in acupuncture we're doing something a bit different. We're peeking from the windows inside the house, you know. <laughs> we go <laughs> you know, we <laughs> sneaking through the back door. We, we go, I am using the points to access the energy system, you know. It's not made that for that. It's made for the energy system to look outside and enjoy the, the scenery. Not made for us to go and peep through. But sometimes when there is a, a disturbance and I can't go through the door, I go and knock through the window. Okay? So, this is the, the way we are shielded now. I want this certain energy, this balancing energy, to bring it inside the energy functions of my body, if I want to use it with the body. So, first of all, I ask myself, what do I want it to resonate with? The first, uh, an easy way, I want to enter into resonance with my heart. Okay? I just draw a heart with the ventricles, with all that, with the valves and everything. Okay. Now, 
if I come near this drawing, and this drawing is in my energy field, will a resonance of shape happen between this shape and the similar shape inside my body? Or uh, instead, uh, I, not to give you my bad, I'll do that. If I put my hand like that, will a resonance between this and my heart happen? Okay, that means you can use an anatomy book to balance your energy system, can't you? Every organ that you, that you feel a bit upset about, you just take the picture and keep looking at it for some time, you'll balance it. Within, you will, yeah, within a certain extent you'll balance it. Just by looking at, at the picture. So what if the picture is a real picture of somebody's... No, 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 no not, not, not that, an anatomy diagram. If you take some, a picture from a real person, you'll enter into resonance with the real person. He, he might be, I don't know the picture, might be of sick person, all the, no, an anatomy diagram. Now, <coughs> this is only taking into consideration the shape. The more detail I put, the more detail I enter into resonance with. So here, the level of detail, we call that entering to resonance, that means I've opened a path to access the heart without opening, you see, I can access it through resonance. So we use resonance of shape for what we call navigation within the energy system. Navigation here means not only between the organs, but also size-wise. My navigation, I could draw a DNA and then I navigate on DNA level. I could draw a cell, navigate on cell level, I can draw whatever I draw will pull my navigation into that level, you see. So I can use drawings on any level to enter into resonance. Now, when you work on the energy level, then it is more logical <coughs> to work on energy anatomy. You see, in acupuncture meridians, they are lines of energy in the body. So usually, you can diagnose an energy meridian at a distance, irrelevant, the person could be in China, could be here, could be anywhere, you can diagnose a meridian and correct it at a distance, because it's energy, if it's made of energy, then I, ca I can enter into resonance with it, very easy. Now, and I'll show you how to do that, you're going to do this exercise in the next three days with, with diagrams. Now, instead of looking at the heart, why da don't I try to analyze the energy flows within the heart itself to find an energy anatomy within the heart? So what we started doing many years ago was we tune our instrument to one frequency, one type of energy, and follow it. You might have one going like this, something you follow it and it turns out to be going like this and then like this, okay? So you follow it. Then you adjust to another one, you find another one, another frequency in there. How will it move, let's say, it might move like this and then go like this and then turn like this. Then you start tracing the third one and the fourth one and all that until you have traced the whole wire mesh of energy that is sort of on which matter is, is superimposed, the, on, on which the physical matter is superimposed. Now every one of those flows here has a different frequency so that they don't cancel each other out, they're superimposed and each one will is somehow linked to a, fu a certain function in the heart. Now, when I draw one of those, now when I look at this, they are in direct resonance now with the function inside. Irrelevant of the small shapes and all that, they are in resonance. So this is a biosignature of a certain function of the heart. So it's in resonance with it. Now, the, with the biosignatures, we work a bit on the tips here in such a way there are small bendings here in the tips 
at the entry of every bisignature, we work here on the tip. Because when you have a straight line like that, and you come and make a small thing like that, you create a center here. So when the energy goes in or goes out, it gets impregnated with the balancing energy. So, but it has to be measured because when in a diagram like that, one direction could bring it and the other, if the energy is flowing in this direction, if you do it in that direction, it will just block it. So it's very delicate which one you choose. You can't draw it anyway and just bend. It has to be done exactly like it's in the books. Now, I have this, I have the balancing energy and I have resonance. That means I can bring the balancing energy into the organ. Now what happens if an organ has some imbalance and I bring a biosignature, I can draw it on the hand or put it here. What happens is that resonance, once the biosignature is in my energy field or in my field, energy will flow into it, moves into it. If there is exactly the same pattern inside the body, resonance will occur. Now if there's this by signature if you draw it wrong nothing will happen it's just like anything on your on, on your clothes or like those drawings or anything they don't make so much difference they, they would affect energy up and down one or two percent up and down but not really much so it's either resonance or nothing you can't go wrong here you've either opened the door or not opened the door with resonance means you've opened the door and what happens in resonance, like uh, two musical chords, you amplify the sound. So what if you don't have it inside for that? Nothing will happen. No, but... Inside you, with the biosignatures are, uh, l let's say, are taken from the energy paths inside you. Right. So when you put them, they enter into resonance with them. You can't say, I don't have it inside me. I mean, you're made that way. So even if you have something out of balance, it doesn't mean that it imbalances that biosignature inside. So then when you put the... No, if you have something out of balance, you bring it by signature. Resonance will occur. When resonance will occur, it will sort of like having, you know, dust on something or and you throw it off. So when resonance occurs, you're amplifying the, 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 bi the effect of the biosignature so and the balance. Bio It could be out of whack too because, I mean, if any energy flow is blocked mm -hmm. for some reason, you could say the bisignature is out of whack, okay? I mean, sometimes all it needs for this flow inside, if one of them I is disturbed a bit, just a jolt and so it's, it's like... No, 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 no. Okay. You could say, for example, when you speak about shape of bisignature, if you look at an organ that is diseased, the, org the disease organ might have some changes in shape. Now, if the flow of energy in it will follow that shape, so the bisignature might change a bit, but uh, it's n not in essence, it, just in, in size a bit with the organ. So this is the concept of bisignatures, that it's a way of bringing this balancing energy of spiritual power spots into the system. And even if you didn't have the balancing here, the, the sort of harmonic resonance will still be effective. But we always want to put the spiritual aspect with it there to achieve a better effect because that's the, the, the actual good ba balancing. You need balance to bring it inside the organ. Now, this is what we say here. This is not uh, a form of medicine. This <coughs> is a support to any existing form. You can use it with anything. You have, you, you can use it with homeopathy, you can use it with herbal remedy, you can use it with acupuncture. I mean, uh, biogeometry is like I said, qualitative physics. By the time you apply it, 
then all of a sudden it takes it comes out completely different depending on what you apply it on so there's no field in life where we cannot apply by geometry because it's like you saw in architecture we apply it everywhere and what we're going to do tomorrow is first learn how to measure the components what are the components we have to learn a bit radiesthesia irrelevant of biogeometry first what is physics of radiesthesia qualitative physics then I'm not at the end so interested in applications uh, l let's say beyond uh, the components because once you know that we are seeking this energy of balance so usually your whole work is either looking for it or creating it you see this is your whole work so uh, why uh, I'm not interested then in using radiesthesia there are so many in water dowsing to find the water well let's say okay you could do all that but you know once you find your real treasure and this the energy this balancing energy of power spots you spend your life interacting with it because that's the the, the thing that balances everything whether it's architectural that, that you spend your life uh, doing it now when we are speaking about electricity when we're speaking about earth radiation when we're speaking about all that you, all you have to do is create the components of the secret power spots in it inside the harmful energy field and what happens is it will balance it the energy field will become beneficial to you so this is a way and this is a very effective way with earth radiation because earth radiation has a tendency to play around with you earth radiation can actually shift can move can you, you could uh, if you put something to block it it could go around it if you it could go through it after some time earth radiation is very tricky it, those lines can change so instead of trying to block it or or, or shoot it another way some people get sort of put something with uh, like shooting arrows like that in different directions and put it under the bed so if you have earth radiation coming up it gets uh, moved to the side well that's not very nice to your neighbors is it okay is, is that ethical <laughs> I mean shoot it sh shoot it that way <laughs> yes but you're shooting it at somebody else even if you don't get it back I mean shoot why I mean if you deflect anything to somebody else I mean why deflect it to somewhere else so even if it's coming out of the earth and you put something to reflect it back in earth is getting rid of something and you push it back in I mean no well that's what we do if you just change the quality then leave it as it is, just change the quality. Now what will the change of quality do? Now, when we went and made some research in Holland uh, with agricultural research, uh, the idea there was we had some people from uh, so many different movements who were concerned about uh, all life forms. And they were always telling those people at the university uh, you're killing the bacteria, you're doing this, you're doing this, you cannot kill any life form and all that. And they were concerned about biogeometry. They thought now, they, they thought this was very similar to those, you know, electrical resonators that make energy to drive away pests and things like that, and, or something that would kill a certain species, or, and they thought we were putting shapes to kill a certain species, to kill parasites. And I thought, no, we're not doing that, what you're doing. And we explained biogeometry, we just, get we transform the whole orchard into a sacred power spot now this is what happens and this is very strange everything in there goes to the place it is intended to be in because what's really happening is those little parasites they are moving according to natural laws but now you bring electromagnetic waves that distort their orientation how can they take right decisions if you are distorting their orientation 
and then you say they're coming into the house. I mean, they, they don't want to come in your house. Why does a bee come in the house? The bee wants to go for a flower. Why does it come in your house? The orientation is distorted. We've put so much distortion in there. And another thing, if we, there are some parasites that if you have, let's say, apples here, and then one is decaying, what would you do? Take that, the one that's decaying, you take it out. Nature does the same thing. You have trees. One is the king. One is a very weak tree. Parasites go and take that one out. It's a natural thing. Now you bring your electromagnetic waves and weaken the immunity of all the trees. Now, the parasites not to blame. It is programmed <coughs> to cancel or attack the weak tree. Now they're all weak. You see? So what we do when we just make this energy, this balancing energy there. They showed me, the professors there, when I went there, of course they know about agriculture much better than me, they showed me how they have, they don't need any more instruments or pendulums or things to place the colors to, to get this energy. What they do is, they take an aperture, they take the leaf like that and you have a worm, let's say, on the leaf. And then, they, we had color pegs that we placed in the ground. They take the color and move it around. And at a certain spot, the worm gets agitated and jumps off the leaf. But once it's off the leaf, it feels it's okay. I mean, if, even if we cut the leaf, put it on the ground, keep the worm in it, it's happy on it. We put the color there, the worm will jump and stay beside the leaf but not on the leaf. If we were hurting the worm itself, it would be agitated everywhere. No, this is, was not happening. Just it goes off the leaf and then it feels okay. That means its original place in nature is not on that leaf. Now once the balancing energy comes there, it knows. Now the immune system of, of, of the leaf of the tree got activated. It feels it, it jumps off and it goes it must have a certain reason to be there. Now, where is that reason? What is it doing? It will find it. It will go back and find it. So, we just placed a few colors and finish. No parasites, nothing. Now, you know, if you do any organic agriculture, you learn that tomorrow. You can use a strip of paper. We use wooden pegs wooden pegs that are colored because paper would just fly off and so so we just w what happened when we did this in organic agriculture you get a low yield you get 20 percent lower yield per acre than normal agriculture because when you put vitamins chemicals and all that you get bigger fruits and you get much more so the farmer is unhappy to begin with to work in organic agriculture and then you're adding so many secondary plants and all things around it that it costs more at the end. So in Holland they were thinking now okay we can convince our people but when we enter into a competition when we have European Union when we have all that how can I convince an Italian in, the, in Sicily down there to pay more for my apples because they are healthier. Everything so they asked me to come there and do and we did the placement and what we came out a much higher yield per acre we had so much so many more apples and we had bigger apples and the colors were very vivid but the nicest thing was when we put the apples there and beside the control ones the others decayed in, a, in about a couple of weeks and those for three four months they were there, they didn't need any type of preservation or anything like that. And since then, we went into, we did the apples, we did potato seeds, we did, we, we did so many things there. And they're very excited, we keep continuing with that. And because when we speak about uh, affecting immune systems, when you work with human beings, somebody will come and tell you, oh, placebo effect, uh, as subconscious, and all those, uh, this stuff. Although in a virus C projects, there's no placebo effects. I mean, you can convince him as much as you can, 
nothing can help in virus C, but uh, on a plant, you can't say placebo effect on a plant, you see? You can't say placebo effect on the uh, parasites. I don't go and tell the worms, I'm here now, so go away or come. It doesn't work. So this is, I'm giving you those examples for you to see that by geometry is not uh, just uh, something that will make you feel better or something do that no you can actually when you balance a place you have the spiritual environment there you have the balancing environment there then your body should start getting balanced from any problems then you can go a step further you can take a color like I could say now somebody would come up with a certain problem that he feels a certain pain or something like that and the other would take a color and move around the room and place it somewhere and I want this person here to feel better just by placing the color so this is the therapeutic placement for a s specific problem then when you take the color off the problem comes back again but so but when you you do that in a house you should really be able to see uh, the difference the biggest difference in a house what we do with the electromagnetic field is I superimpose this energy from the entry at the house from where you have the water pipes coming in where you have the electrical electricity coming in and it's there that I do most of my work to have this energy superimposed on electricity superimposed on the pipes and have it come all over the house so all of a sudden the whole electrical system the light there is beaming healing energy everything is beaming healing energy so you're not fighting 